and all yeah i also welcome session chairs and moderator mr aditya pundit country director india and south asia the climate reality project mr r k sharma regional director regional institute of cooperative management chandigarh and mr bhavesh swami lead clean energy policy engagement in the climate reality project india also our program esteemed partner institutions being represented by their heads conveners ceos directors promoters like sanrakshak mr prasoon shukla india graha kirana foundation indonesia dr intan ricm chandigarh dr r k sharma dr jitendra goirala iim bss dr vani parvi chitkara university and dr dai yun jong and mr aditya kundir my fellow speakers dr sunita roda president aps wdp mr hitesh kumar gulati director general honorary and dr rajiv choudhary honorary director capacity building training aps wdp to commemorate world environment day 2022 that is today 5th of june 2022 through the international youth sustainable development dialogue 2022 we all are delighted to witness the deliberation from experts in environment conservation climate advocacy climate change education and forest service specifically working directly or indirectly in the gamut of environment conservation and climate change it is indeed our pleasure to receive registrations from various states of india and across borders including dubai south korea japan philippines indonesia ethiopia we welcome the august gathering of participants from diverse including academicians business consultants corporate social professionals corporate social responsibility professional development practitioners entrepreneurs government officials and public health experts legal practitioners students and others like let me brief you brief about you know aps wdp it's a think tank not for profit organization voluntary youth network and membership based organization working in government industry corporate global organizations founded in 2014 inspired from unesco esg world conference 2014 at nagoya it has received special consultative status under economic and social council of united nations since 2019 affiliation and accreditation under united nations department of global communications since 2019 and united nation environment program and united nation environment assembly since 2022 it has a sole axiom of promoting social work education for sustainable development and working on three of the five you know unesco esd global action programs that is building capacity of educators and trainers empowering and mobilizing youth and accelerating sustainable solutions at local level aps wdp has extended its knowledge and institutional network across the globe in various regions by signing various mous with diverse agencies on promoting un sdgs this is all about you know the program background and formal welcome and may i now take responsibility you know like as a convener to introduce you know why we are you know having this you know a dialogue like aligned to the united nations theme of the year on world environment day and un sdgs the association has been commemorating the day since 2015 by collaborating with the climate reality india in chandigarh region by way of organizing various advocacy events campaigns capacity building programs and virtual dialogues this year under the edges of aps wdp we have conceived second in series the international youth sustainable development virtual dialogue 2022 in partnership with climate reality project india south asia asia climate change education center jeju south korea chitkara university punjab in india regional institute of cooperative management chandigarh india an integrated association of medical basic social scientists imbss in india grah kirana foundation in indonesia and sanrakshad again from india with an aim to address the issues of conserving biodiversity restoring ecosystems communicating climate change on today in addition this dialogue is intended to develop understanding and exploring indigenous knowledge on biodiversity conservation and climate change mitigation and adaptation World Environment Day is celebrated annually on 5th of June and is the United Nations principal vehicle for encouraging awareness and action for the protection of the environment. First held in 1974, it has been a platform for raising awareness on environmental issues such as marine pollution, human population, global warming, sustainable consumption, wildlife crime, and this day is global platform for public outreach with participation from 143 countries annually. Each year the program has provided a theme and forum for business non government organizations communities government 
and celebrities to advocate environmental causes. The theme for World Environment Day 2022 is living sustainably in harmony with nature and will be hosted by Sweden this year. The World Environment Day 2022, a global campaign, only one third calls for transformative changes to policies, choices to enable cleaner, greener, and sustainable living in harmony with nature. It will focus on the need to live sustainably in harmony and our possibility for shifting to greener lifestyle through both policies and individual choices. Only one earth was the motto for the 1972 Stockholm Conference. So 50 years on, the motto is as pertinent as ever. This planet is our only home and humanity must safeguard its finite resources. This year, 2022, a historic milestone for the UNEP and the global environmental community as it marks the 50th anniversary of establishment of UNEP as an outcome of the Stockholm Conference. It also coincides with the high level Stockholm 50 plus international meetings. This in Galactic events serve as an opportunity for the international community to strengthen cooperation and show leadership in the transformation towards a more sustainable society. And commemorating World Environment Day 2022 rest on UN Decade on Ecosystem and Restoration 2021 and 30, which can take many forms, growing trees, greening cities, rewilding gardens, changing diets, or cleaning up rivers and coasts. This is the generation that can make peace with nature. Ecosystem restoration means assisting in the recovery of ecosystems that have been degraded or destroyed, as well as conserving the ecosystems that are still intact. Healthier ecosystems with richer biodiversity yield greater benefits such as more fertile soils, bigger yields of timber and fish, and larger stores of greenhouse gases. Restoration can happen in many ways. For example, through actively planting or by removing pressures so that nature can recover on its own. It is not always possible or desirable to return an ecosystem to its original state. We still need free farmland and infrastructure on land that once forest, for instance, ecosystems like societies need to adapt to a changing climate. Keeping in view the theme of the World Environment Day, Living sustainably in harmony with nature, the virtual dialogue will witness three interesting panel discussions today. First panel, cooperatives is hybrid approach to kick off sustainable development and community livelihood among indigenous communities. Second panel, 2030 global agenda, role of youth in environmental sustainability. And third final panel, role of media in enhancing of environmental awareness and communicating climate change. So this is the program background and we will be having, you know, one by one, the three panel discussions. And before going for panel discussion, we have here with us our chief guest of today's dialogue, Senator Dr. P.K.C. Bose, a hardcore global sustainability specialized wind energy professional. Dr. P.K.C. Bose has many first time hat tricks in his credits. He has successfully commissioned three most reputed German corporations in India over a period of close to three decades of his professional life. Dr. Bose is like a brand ambassador to German metal stand SME companies in India as he has been instrumental for settling down few German metal stand SMEs companies in the country besides being the founder managing director of SEW Eurodrive India. He was the managing director for India and area countries for Eurodrive as he was the catalyst for energy conservation for various first time applications in India. Dr. Bose has been campaigning for sustainability, be it energy conservation, carbon emissions, reductions, energy efficiency, and now for green energy as the most sustainable source. He is known as the sustainability ingest, ingest evangelist in India. He is the one and the only Indian in the Senate of Economy as senator in Germany. Dr. Bose is a certified climate-related leadership corps trained by Nobel laureate Al Gore and the former vice president of US. Dr. Bose is an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, Indian School of Business, Wharton Business School, and Kellogg School of Management, USA, and holds his PhD from Washington International University, US. He has nearly 30 years of experience in the corporate world on a social or as a successful business leader. He has been featured two times consecutively in the Forbes magazine in year 2011 and 12 as the first Indian who got 
inducted as senator into the Senate of Economy, Germany, Dr. Bose has been invited to participate as a VIP guest for the Nobel Prize Forum in 2018 at Oslo, Norway. He was also invited by the Norwegian Parliament for discussion on renewable energy policies in December 2018. And he is also the recipient of prestigious Business Excellence Award from the World Confederation of Business US, Outstanding Entrepreneur Award of Enterprise Asia and CEO of the Year Award by Indian Leadership Conclave Global Excellence Award by Top Management Consortium, Udyog Ratna Award. He's the first Indian being inducted in the advisory board of the famous University of Denver, US, and a member of the largest corporate bodies and associations in India. Dr. Bose is the board of Global Wind Energy Council, India, in August 2021. Since last three, 33 years, he is a driving force of Enercon Wind Energy, the wholly owned subsidiary of Enercon Group, Germany, the largest privately owned wind turbine makers in the world, as its vice chairman and managing director for India, started the Green Field Project and making India's global export hub for the world. So he has vast credentials in the field of energy conservation, wind energy. So we have the honor to welcome him again in this virtual dialogue. Over to Dr. P. K. C. Bose, sir. Please. Thank you, Mr. Trivedi. Very good morning to all environmental lovers. It's an honor and privilege to be here today with the special day, the World Environment Day. As Mr. Trivedi mentioned that since 1972 in the Stockholm conference onwards, if you really, since we, are, since we are celebrating the 50th year, it is important to look at that last 20 years of developments in the environmental sector. What in the past we have not done, we started realizing and started doing it, though it is not too late. Since I work very closely on three areas, one is the environment, second is water, and third is green energy. Let me give you some perspective, especially on the Indian background. Few days back, I had a meeting with an interesting, a very, very interesting company, a startup company in Pune. They make the, filter, uh, the no filter pollution uh, retrofits. So during the discussion, it was came to my knowledge that they have so many challenges, though they have the patent from the United States, Europe, and also from Asia. So this filterless technology, which is the first time in the country, which has so many benefits. So when I started discussing with them, especially about how do you support reducing the pollution and making a green environment, the first thing they came and said, would you like to join us to, a, to meet a, the chairman of a pollution control board in India? I met this gentleman and it was not surprised, it was really shocking that by law, you are only supposed to use such filtration systems only up to 800 kVA. Above 800 kVA, there is no regulations and systems, no policies in place. Now, if you take a cumulative overview of the hotels, hospitals, educational institutions, software companies who are all using very large generator sets up to 15,000 kVA. So it doesn't apply to them at all. Why? Because there are no regulation, no uh, systems in place, no policies in place. And he said, this decision has to come from the Central Pollution Control Board. Now look at the, the difference. Somebody wanted to do something great to support the great our uh, in, in environment, but then our regulatory systems, our policies are not allowing us to do. How do we really create a green environment in our country? This is a big question. And I think it is important for all of us to look at that. You know, if I'm, you know, this is only a small part of the bigger, you know, system I'm talking about, uh, the filtration system. So I was trying to encourage this company. I said that, okay, you should actually go to Poland 
because that is the most polluted country in Europe. So the Poland does the first instant itself, when I started talking to some companies in Poland, they said, we are definitely looking for this kind of an opportunity because we have a huge challenge. So look at the difference between these two, that in our country, our own uh, people making this wonderful technology, but we have no tickets. This is unfair. So it's a time, may I request to APS, WDP, as well as uh, the Climate Reality Project in India, because you are all the new, new, neutral authorities and uh, you know making things to happen in this country. It is time we should take this forward and give awareness to the respective decision makers to build a sustainable environmental system in the country. Number two is, I also work with the water authorities. So my experience is until we have, we literally see a fountain, we will not realize that there is a leakage in the sewage pipes or the portable water pipes. Six feet underneath, when it leaks and it, it only shows up on the ground, then we act on that. I talked to a lot of municipal corporation in India. I said, why do you, you why don't you go for the modern system. There is something called CIPP, which is called cured in place piping. It's a trenchless technology where you don't need to dig out the pipe. You can do a lining inside the pipe by using a glass fiber reinforcement. For instance, if it is a 900 mm dia pipe, if it is fully damaged, doesn't matter. You can open the manhole when there is no traffic in the night, you go there, I mean, the, the company which produce, they go there, they, they open the manhole, tell the municipal corporation not to pump the water there. So you get an MG pipe. They send a CCTV inside, take all the damage details. And next day, they make a soft pipe made out of glass fiber, which is six times stronger than steel and many a times lighter than steel. So for example, if it is a 900 mm dia pipe, you make a 3 mm thickness a liner inside. It's a soft, impregnated with the resin. So it's a soft liner. You pull it through a manhole from one manhole to the other through a winch, stop, close the other side, and compress the air from this side. This will take the shape of oval, the round, or square, any kind of a surface. It will take the exactly the same shape. And you send an ultraviolet curing system and it runs for four times and it is completely cured. From 12 o'clock in the night when there is no traffic until six o'clock in the morning, you complete six, uh, sorry, one kilometers within six hours time. In India, in the normal circumstances, you dig out the pipe, take it out, public nuisance, traffic jam, electric cable cutting, everything. And it takes nearly three to four months. This is what I was told by Delhi Jail Board. In, in New Delhi. So the CIPP is 50% lesser in cost. Much, if it's six hours, one kilometer. And the cost benefit, the life benefit. The companies who produce, who does this, they give a return warranty of 60 years, six zero. So 60 years, you don't have to do anything. You can even increase the pressure because the material is six times stronger than the existing steel or metal pipes. But in India, we don't have any such policies. So the pol policy paralysis, that is the biggest challenge in India, according to me, for creating an, a healthy environment. We have no shortage of water in this country, but because of we lose a lot of water and we always cry that there is a scarcity of water. Now, number th three, coming to the green energy. COP26 in Glasgow in November, our prime minister has made an announcement that India will install 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030, out of which 150 gigawatt by wind energy. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to draw your attention here. It's a very important thing. If we have to attain 150 gigawatt commissioning by 2030, from 2020, we need to install 18 gigawatt wind energy. And the current situation in our country is two gigawatt. Eight times more will we be able to do it? That's the biggest question. Indeed, according to me, we can still do it if we have a policy and regulatory system in place. For instance, we have no repowering policy. The class A and B wind sites, mainly the class A wind sites, all occupied with nearly 20 or over 20 years old wind turbines, which are only 800 kilowatt and maximum one megawatt. 20 years old and today this climate, the whole technology has changed. So if India establish a repowering policy with a strict guideline that over 20 or 20 years old turbines to be removed and all those places to be repowering to be done with bigger turbines of four, four megawatt or five megawatt, we will be able to generate five times more power doing only regulatory and policies in place. So there is a huge opportunity. And of course, then the balance you can always manage because we have enough and more low wind uh, sites in the country and this is not a big challenge. So in order to fulfill our prime minister's dream, the first and foremost thing, whether it is environment, whether it is water, whether it is green energy, we need to have policies and regulatory systems in place. If all the stakeholders come together and say that, yes, you will not have any problem for land acquisition, land clearing, the grid availability, installation and commissioning, facilitating by the respective municipal corporations or panjayas or remote areas, uh, the decision makers. We will not have a, any difficulty to do commissioning of all the projects. We also need to take advices from the international agencies who are neutral agencies. They have no uh, political or profit Nothing, they, they are absolutely neutral agencies. If we take the advices from them, they will be able to tell us that, how do we make energy efficiency? What are the ways of energy conservation and so on? So the need of the hour is regulatory and policy guidelines, system monitoring and commitment by all parties, ensuring India has the best environment to live for our next generation. Thank you very much. And special thanks to uh, the, all the members from the Climate Reality Project and also Mr. Trivedi for having me here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bose. And uh, definitely we are you know, having your words of wisdom and truly inspired by you, like the Climate Reality Project and APSWDP, you know, can you know, work in synchronization with local government and cities. And definitely cities are struggling, like Indian municipalities are struggling with technology, with, you know, new technology transfer, green technology. And the latest technologies which you have referred here, like CIPP, you know, will be uh, definitely of, you know, great help for Indian cities. So we will work in synchronization with, you know, all of our partners and try to advocate with the local government. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Now, in you know, furtherance to this program, now I will welcome Dr. and Emeritus Professor Dai Yun Jiang. He's the guest of honor in today's you know dialogue, and he's also the Emeritus Professor at Jeju National University. Professor Dai Yun Jiang is presently the director of Asia Climate Change Education Center in Jeju in South Korea, and he received BA and MA degree in sociology from Korean University and PhD in environmental sociology from the University of Queensland in Australia. And he was a professor of sociology at Jeju National University from 81 to 2012. And his past major professional activities include teaching as professor at the University of Sheffield in UK, the president of Asia Pacific Sociological Association, a delegate of South Korean government to UNFCCC, a delegate of South Korean government to OECD environmental meetings, and a member of Presidential Commission on Sustainable Development, Republic of Korea. 
He has published more than 60 environment related research papers in domestic and international journals and seven books, including environmental sociology. He has conducted 95 unpublished environment related research projects <coughs> by domestic and international organizations. So today in the inaugural session as a keynote speaker and a guest of honor, and he will speak on how to overcome uh, the limitations inherent in sustainable development. So over to Dr. Chiang. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here uh, as a speaker at uh, <clears throat> inaugural uh, session. Uh, as I have been uh, introduced here, uh, I'm serving currently uh, as the director of Asia Climate Change Education Center. Okay, the topics I would like to deliver today is how to overcome the limitations inherent uh, inherent in sustainable development. So uh, this is my, uh, uh, oh, I'm from uh, Jeju Island. Jeju Island is located between uh, Korea and uh, Japan. Uh, the Asia Climate Change Education is also based in Jeju uh, Island. Uh, this is the uh, outline I would like to deliver today. Uh, as the topic shows how to overcome the limitations inherent in sustainable development. In order to understand uh, these topics, I think we need to have an outline the emergency process of the concept and the implications of sustainable development. Okay, the next one is after the, uh, the concept and implication of sustainable development emerged by WCED, uh, as we uh, know, it was uh, 1987. Uh, however, during the uh, 1980s, there were very hot debates on sustainable development, whether sustainable development is useful or not. Uh, so we need uh, some basic uh, understanding about the uh, hot debate. Then we can review again on the basis of the two things. One is the basic concept and implications of sustainable development and the debates on sustainable development emerged during the 19th, 1990s. Based on these two, we can catch something uh, about the limitations. Sustainable development is a very uh, good idea for uh, coexisting. Uh, between humans and nature as we have planned. However, we can find some limitations. The evidence is, for example, even though sustainable development has been launched uh, some decades ago, however, we are still faced with a uh, lot of challenges from nature, such as climate change, ocean depletion, uh, and natural disaster like that. That means sustainable development is a good ideology and the practice for achieving uh, the successful economic development together with the coexistence with the uh, uh, nature. However, uh, we have some then. As the concluding mark, I would like to suggest. So, according to the program, uh, we have, uh, I have just uh, 10 minutes. Therefore, here you can see the first, the emergency process of the concept and the implication development. These can be classified into four sectors. The first one is neoclassic economy in the 19th century. Second one, uh, social science in the uh, 1970s and the international organizations in the 1970s. Okay, those three are uh, uh, the, uh, even though they did not use 
the terminology of sustainable development. However, their idea about the relationship between human activities and the conservation of nature, they could find some conflict. So even though they have not used the terminology of sustainable development, however, they, I think their idea is based on the sustainable development, okay? After that, as you, we know, WCED suggested the, uh, the formality, the concept, uh, of sustainable development in the uh, 1918s. This is the emergency process. So we do not have enough time uh, uh, in, uh, to explain in detail. Just uh, I will uh, present the uh, outlines. The neoclassic economy in the uh, 18th century, this is, I think, about 100 years after the emergence of industrialization in 19th century. Not used the terminology, sustainable development. However, their main point was market price should include ecological cost for saving resources through increasing the market price of a manufactured product, then will be resulted in preventing nature from being polluted. This is the first emergency about the idea of sustainable development. Then in the 1970s, uh, we had two categories of scholars. One is pessimistic perspective uh, industrialization. The other one uh, was optimistic perspective on uh, industrialization. The first category, they argued industrialization uh, no more promoted the industrialization. If this is advanced, continuously we, we will be uh, we uh, will be faced with unsustainability in terms of so many environmental social economic sectors therefore we have to satisfy it with the current level of material affluence and the convenience in everyday life because the uh, industrialization has been uh, advanced for improving the, uh, the uh, material affluence and the convenience in uh, everyday life. Then we got unexpectedly a very uh, serious side effect. We call them the environmental problems. However, the, uh, another group, uh, the uh, <clears throat> argued industrialization should be advanced continuously. The limitations can be overcome by innovation of technology and economic development based on reinvestment capital like that. And the international organization in the 90s, uh, United Nations or the uh, IUCN like that. They uh, main point was, oh, we cannot stop sustainable development. Uh, we cannot stop industrialization. However, we cannot continue industrialization using the current way. So as a compromise perspective, yeah, the uh, uh, international organizations argued, the example is in the uh, 1970s, United Nations uh, argued only one earth. And uh, uh, 19, uh, the early 1980s, uh, eco-development, one, only one earth eco-development are just an ide ideology where we have to go for coexistence between nature and the human. However, the international organization, even though they proposed the ideology, only one earth and eco-development. However, they did not propose any action plan for achieving only one earth or eco-development. Then, as we know, 19, uh, 1987, WCED uh, suggested the, uh, uh, using the three sectors, uh, environmental and economic, uh, economic development, environmental uh, conservation, 
and uh, overcome the curve of societies. Then, as we know, integrated conceptual framework of the three components like economy, environmental, and the society. Uh, and after that, 1992 Rio Environmental Conference. Then, uh, as, we, uh, as we know, the WCD just uh, proposed the conceptual framework and the uh, implication of sustainable development. However, WCED did not suggest the action plan in order to achieve the sustainable development. However, as we know, Rio, uh, Rio uh, Environmental Conference, they suggested the, uh, the action plan. Uh, this is the uh, Agenda 21. And after uh, 1992, the uh, Rio Environmental Conference continued for reviewing and evaluate, evaluating the achievement of sustainable development. So the same was Rio, uh, Rio plus 10 or Rio plus uh, 20 like that. And the, uh, uh, we know the uh, Millennium Development Goals, the target year from 2000 to 2015 with the eight major goals. And uh, at the moment, uh, it, uh, 20, uh, 2015 Sustainable Development Goal uh, were launched uh, uh, the target year uh, until 2030. Uh, 17 major goals. This is a very uh, brief history of the emergence of sustainable development. Okay, this is a, a, com a very simple comparison between uh, Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. The difference uh, can be identified in terms of goals and the uh, detailed uh, uh, agent and uh, the goal the uh, goals for the sectors of the goals. Yeah. Okay, then to debate three categories. Okay, then the first one, after uh, <clears throat> the sustainable development has been uh, suggested, then the debate during the 19, uh, 19th, sustainable development is useful or useless and weak and strong sustainable development and the emergence of ecological modernization in the 2000s, okay. Then useful, uh, this is the, uh, some uh, outlines about the debate between usefulness and useless, all right. And the weak and the strong sustainable development, the difference is on the basis of the category of resources, then the different perspective on how to use resources and perspective on sustainable development. They have different, they suggested uh, different perspectives. Uh, and the uh, ecological modernization in uh, 2000, uh, 2000, as we know, modernization in the 19th century, this is the emergence of modern society in terms of uh, democratization and eco uh, ecological, economical, industrialization, socially, urbanization. And at the moment, we need a new modernization in relation to environment. The uh, emergence of modern society, the modernization uh, was focused uh, on political, political, economic, social, cultural factor. Now, we need to re-modernize in relation to environment. This is why the terminology of ecological modernization was denoted. Okay, this is the basic outlines. All right, then, based on then, uh, I think we have lots of limitations inherent in sustainable development. However, broadly, I think uh, we can categorize into four sectors. The first one is horizontal perspective. The second one is sustainable development, even though set up the category of uh, social factor. However, the social sector is not inclusive. Uh, inclusive. 
And the uh, third one is, is less efficient approach to the achievement of sustainable development goals. The uh, last one is no mechanism for drawing uh, driving the social consensus because uh, I will explain in detail. Uh, <clears throat> all right. The, as you can, horizontal perspective, uh, sustainable development is based on horizontal perspective. As you know, uh, as we know, goals of component of sustainable development, okay. Environmental, each goal uh, is set up as conservation. Economy, development. Society, increase in material affluence and convenience in life. When we review the three goals from the three component, we can find the three goals are in conflict. For example, in order to achieve the goal of environmental conservation, if economic is uh, uh, advanced for development, then this is in conflict, all right? However, economic development can be matched with the goal of society increase in material affluence, okay. Therefore, these three goals are in conflict because the sustainable development perspective uh, it, uh, has set up these three components are equally important. Three goals are equally important. Therefore, no control tower to solve the conflict. This is why we uh, still we have the result in human induced societal challenge causing climate change. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to uh, we need to solve uh, a mechanism to solve the conflict among the three goals. Okay. Therefore, uh, if we set up. For example, uh, not the, uh, uh, the uh, we place the, the goal of environmental at as the top value, all right? Then economic and the society, their goal should be under the uh, environment. Therefore, uh, if the goal of economy or goal of society is in conflict with the, the goal of environment, then the two goals from economic and the society should be controlled. However, the goal of economic and the goal of society, they can be in a mutual benefit. So we call uh, such a framework is a vertical perspective. So the vertical perspective would result in ecological allocation of not only environment, but also economic and social sectors within the caring capacity of nature. All right. The uh, second one, not inclusive category uh, coverage of uh, social this means original framework of social development is focusing on poverty. However, other societal, uh, social related sectors impacting on the sustainable development. For example, population growth, technology, lifestyle, age, cultural ethos, social form uh, like that. So very limited uh, social sectors are carved in the original framework of uh, sustainable development. So we need to expand the coverage uh, of social sectors. As you know, population growth is important, uh, impacting on sustainability of economic and environment. However, original framework does not include those social sectors. Therefore, society as a whole would result in not full sustainable development due to the limited number of sectors included in original framework of sustainable development. The uh, third one is le less efficient approach to achievement of such a sustainable development goals. As we know, 70 major goals. When we 
look at carefully. The 17 goals conceptually are different. However, they do not exist independently, rather uh, in a mechanism interacting with each other as an integrated reality. Nonetheless, then the 70 goals uh, fo uh, focusing on them as if they are independent reality. For example, goal, if you have goal one, two, all right, then one is the goal of uh, the uh, goal one, okay? However, when we look at the second uh, goal, then goal one is a means to be for achieving the uh, goal to like that. Uh, and the, uh, the other one is uh, the means to achieve the goals are focused on more on technology-based rather than nature-based one. Then uh, the difference between the two approaches uh, are like that, okay? Mm. <clears throat> then uh, finally, no mechanism for drawing uh, social consensus. This means government, the primary agent responding to sustainable development through policies. However, the policies are applied to societal uh, sectors, the uh, enterprise, uh, the management system, and the lifestyle of citizens. So even though the uh, government uh, launches very efficient, effective policies, if they are, the policies are against the uh, goal of enterprise or the goal of citizens, then the policy cannot be uh, achieved successfully. Therefore, we need an agreement from enterprise, uh, citizens, even mass media, all social groups. There, this uh, will be the uh, uh, social consensus. However, sustainable development, we cannot find the mechanism for drawing the social consensus among the social groups. So without their active participation based on social consensus would be a policy alone would be difficult to achieve sustainable development. Nonetheless, no mechanism uh, driving social consensus from them is institutionalized in the framework of sustainable development. Okay, then this is uh, my final conclusion. Uh, I think uh, all of uh, you have, uh, have seen the movie Titanic, okay? Very luxury Titanic. And according to the uh, Christian Bible, uh, we have the uh, Noah's Ark, all right? In agricultural society, we enjoy the poor, not uh, economically poor and uh, very inconvenient Noah's Ark. However, uh, in the industrial society, we are enjoying luxury Titanic. What happened to the luxury Titanic? Eh, sink into the sea. Therefore, industrialization, I think uh, we are enjoying luxury Titanic to be sunk shortly into the sea. If we enjoy Titanic, I think our near future in everyday life, uh, like Toshi. Uh, okay, then uh, we have to wear the mask. This is not the mask against the uh, COVID-19. In everyday life, uh, uh, we have to uh, take the mask on our faces. Okay, uh, this is, uh, however, the pet hmm, dog is also take the uh, mask. I think a dog is innocent. We are guilty. Why dog should uh, wear the mask on face? The reason is very simple. They are living uh, with humans at the same era. They are very unlucky, all right? Uh, if we continue enjoying Titanic, this is our near future. This is my conclusion. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Jiang, and you have
very beautifully, you know, taken a journey through your presentation, right from 70s, you know, to alarming situation when we have just met COVID-19, you know, pandemic just two years back. We are still struggling and passing through the same, you know, like, but, you know, we have overcome, but anyhow, you have, you know, concluded with a mask on, you know, faces, but COVID has given us a mask, you know, for two years. So we shall, you know, nature has alarmed us. So we have to act, you know, as nature desires. And you have, you know, uh, you know, elaborated, you know, approaches, you know, strategies, and how beautifully, you know, you know, the, you know, the policies framework, even the clashes, you know, the classical views. So it has, you know, the presentation has given an array of questions, you know, to the participants and uh, for thinking and to act. So coming on to our next speaker, our special guest, Ms. Gitanjali M. And I'll just brief you about her, you know, CV. Like she is an Indian Forest Services Punjab cadre officer. And she is, you know, having a background with agricultural, forestry, and biodiversity. And she is an alumnus of Unit R. Sipal Jeju and currently pursuing her Doctor of Philosophy from University of Helsinki, Finland. And she also possesses a player for wildlife photography and social activism. So over to Gitan Shri. Good morning, everyone. Thank Thanks for the opportunity to join this discussion today. And as I understand today, we are discussing about understanding, exploring and enhancing knowledge on environment and biodiversity conservation and climate change. So, the slides are moving, yeah. So to, this is the decade of ecosystem restoration. In this context, I would like to present you a few theories which people discuss the reason for land degradation. So one here that I present to you is that of Skarman and Koffer in 2013. What he says is that the land degradation is because of the three disconnects which we have in the human race today. One is the spiritual cultural disconnect, the other is the social and the ecological disconnect. So as Talbert and Brooke says, the humanity is the cause for the ecological and social problems we are facing today. The limited and disconnected way we see ourselves and each other and the social ecological system is the core for all the problems that we are facing. So this theory appears to be very valid to me personally, I see that a lot of our traditions had principles of sustainability and conservation engraved in them. Many of your ancient cultures had this, but slowly we are losing this culture and tradition and value systems. The other theory is that of weak and strong sustainability. This shows how our understanding has been over the years, like Professor Jong explained to us about various con concepts, and this was also one of the thing mentioned in his talk also. Like in 1987, the concept of sustainability was that the three things, nature, society, and economy were different things, and they just were overlapping to a certain extent. That is, was our understanding of sustainability. So we did not care so much to preserve nature. We were focusing on developing our society and building our economy without knowing that. I mean, we just thought they just overlap a bit and they are like totally uh, separate. But the present context, after so much of uh, facing the problem, now people know that the concept of strong sustainability is that the society and economy are resting on nature. So this nature or environment is the carpet that we are all standing on. If this is pulled, then, then everything just collapses. So also hand 2013 uh, shows this diagram very nicely that the ecological system is the base and the societal system rests about it and the economic system about that. But even today we behave as if the economic system is the foremost. 
without understanding the economy rests on the ecology only. So the and when talking of this, I would like to mention of a recent review that happened by uh, Das Gupta in UK. The UK has realized after a long time that this concept of economy resting on the ecology and they have prepared a very comprehensive and detailed report. I'm just summarizing a few things that emerges out of the report and the emphasis given by Dr. Partha Das Gupta after this review. He stresses that our education systems should introduce nature studies from the earliest in our lives. And he also says that the concept of nature, nature capital should be included in our economic models. And he emphasizes that the environment ministers will have to ask how much the farmers should be paid to set aside land for greening the landscape or whether a fossil fuel subsidy should be eliminated or not, things and things like this. These are some of the glimpses out of the report, but it's a very elaborate and detailed report that Das Gupta just brought out. After seeing, he also talks about the human race as a natural resource manager and the natural asset manager. So after reading this report, uh, the concept is he all wants us to become a responsible asset manager or a responsible natural resource manager. So Nowadays, like there is another concept like with the kids. I read in a book like they say, like the kids have the nature deficit syndrome. So that is one of the reasons the wholesome development of a child is not happening. They are too much onto the gadgets. The COVID was a uh, boon and as well as a bane in the sense when after this lockdown, nature recuperated itself. But then as humans, like we have forced our kids to study on online forums and they have suffered a lot psychologically, emotionally, and their understanding of the environment is also like not happening. Something else is happening. So, and here I just introduced a quote of Gaspar where he says that not science, but spirituality is the help that can help in saving the environment. He says that I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, apathy, and to do with those, and we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. So it's in a way reality. So we need to reorient our science to address these things. We also say that spirituality is a science uh, for which we have don't have the theories or formulas yet. Spirituality is a great science, in fact. So uh, this is my view, like how to address the spirituality or sustainability. I, I would say that our traditional system of yogic science of India is a science of spirituality in itself. Yoga means to unite oneself with the universe in a way to expand your consciousness beyond this human body and the human mind and to unite with the nature consciousness. So we are all souls living in a human body and a mind to take care of ourselves and to be a part of the universe. It's vice versa. If you take care of your body and mind perfectly, you, you will in turn take care of the universe very well. So you can address it inside out or outside in. Whichever way we address, it is the same path. So human welfare is going to be the planet or the universe welfare as such, and a sustainable economy is a sustainable ecology as well. So we all need to reconnect back to our roots of culture and tradition of safeguarding our nature and universe and build our lives in tune with the nature and environment. So this is my take on sustainability as such. And these are few uh, verses to food for thought to remind you, like our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi has already told that earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not for every man's greed. And Ralph Waldo Emerson has said that we do not earth, inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. So we have to keep the resources for the future as well. So. Going by our Indian mythology or tradition, what we say, like the soul is born in one body and it goes to next. So everyone is like born and again and again. This is our belief, Indian belief. 
and also not only indian it also in many other beliefs in many other countries so i would like to say that so to let our life uh, be sustainable so we all need to lead a spiritual life and manage this earth for even our own future births on this earth so that's in a way i try to connect these disconnects and spirituality to the whole talk of sustainability we are having today yes thank you so that's my take on this talk today thank you so much for this opportunity and let's continue the discussion thank you thank you ms gitanjali and uh, you have you know being a forest officer from indian services like you have very well quoted like spirituality you know no doubt you know indian traditions and indian culture have propagated always you know if we recall our childhood and we see you know from our childhood what our parents and who you know grandparents used to convey and teach us like respect nature if i recall like you know worshiping a people tree burger tree you know like you know somewhere even you know the tulsi you know these are all you know nature's product and if you find them in our surrounding you are always like having a you know, good positive environment nowadays you know like one of you know i remember i should you know name him like one of my student you know earlier devinder sura like he is a working in police department but he is a passion and he is a passion to you know plant you know only you know neem burger and people all across you know this entire state and he is being recognized by you know various agencies but he is working in government and he has a passion so we have to have such passions and you know time is you know going very rapidly so we need to dare to act dare to act in several disciplines even in behavioral sciences like gitanjali has you know referred here behavior also so we need to work on behavior modification and behavior modification sometimes you know it's not possible at the age of say 40 plus in adults somehow you know egos are there egos clashes so we need to work with children we need to work with youth and uh, as aps aps wdp and under climate reality project we are working on behavioral modification lifestyle change that is the key to you know these challenges nowadays so you know fine you know this is our inaugural session now may i request mr bhavesh swami ji you know to propose a vote of thanks please bhavesh ji uh, thank you thank you dr vivek dr boss <clears throat> your talk was really enthralling the way you took took us on roller coaster ride with respect to clean energy with your insights on water pollution it was really exhilarating thank you so much for giving us all the perspectives on how probably we can move towards a more sustainable future dr jong korea inspires us every day the kind of manufacturing you are doing the kind of help you are providing to the indian counterparts is immense our cars our electronics our technologies our leds are all thankful to you we thank you from the bottom of our heart in terms of taking all these things forward and a special thanks to you for taking us through the journey of sustainability in theory which unfortunately probably as students we are not we were not aware of dr gitanjali for you being a forest officer environment day is day in day out every day we in, we get inspired by people like you working on the field doing their bit despite every kind of challenge that you face we know you know more than us in terms of the challenges in terms of the problems you are facing on the day to day implementation but still we are thankful for taking us through the pyramid of sustainability that to especially in the indian context and adding to the nudge of sustainability and spirituality also ma'am as students as all we are joining out here we are thankful to every speaker who has contributed immensely in terms of our understanding of the subject thank you so very much yes it's okay yeah fine so our inaugural session is you now concluded here now i'll move on to panel one discussion and uh, for that we have here with us a session on like cooperative as a hybrid approach to kick off sustainable development 
and community livelihoods among indigenous communities. And this panel is chaired by Mr. Aditya Pundir, and he is the country director, India and South Asia. And uh, he took over the branch in 2010 and is posted in New Delhi. He received his training from Al Gore, vice president of the US in 2009 on climate change. And he was selected for Australian Leadership Award winning 2013 in environment. He has worked extensively in the field of climate change and sustainability in India. He has authored two books on natural world heritage sites for UNESCO, five environment education CD-ROMs and eight comics for children on environmental issues. He is also represented on consultation committees on climate change in India formed by UNDP, World Bank and UNESCO. I also welcome you know, the panel speakers in this session, Dr. Pupul Dhal, is a journal manager and state head CSR and sustainability of JK Paper Mills Limited in Odisha. He is on the boards of various organizations, which includes the Mentor Climate Reality Project US in India, a general professor of Sri Sri University for Climate Change and Sustainability, co-director the Resource Center for Climate Change, Sustainability Education Practices, Sri Sri University, convener CSR CII Odisha State Council, member regional advisory group. Nabar, Bhubneshwar, member CSR subcommittee, government of Odisha. Our second speaker, Dr. Selman Jacob, is the head climate change and disaster risk reduction at World Vision India. He's a versatile experience of 21 years in the areas of climate change mitigation and adaptation programs, DRR and building resilient communities, climate change sensitization, environmental awareness program, regeneration of degraded lands, carbon footprint management, wash, disaster relief, rehabilitation, environmental monitoring and impact assessment studies, postgraduate level teaching and research. He is adding values to various organizations in different capacities over the years, including like National Coordinator for Climate Change and Environment in World Vision India, Asia Pacific Regional Point Person on DRR, Project Officer Emergency Operations in Church Auxiliary for Social Action, a national level NGO at Delhi, Environment Consultant in ERS Solutions Private Limited and Environment and Safety Consultancy. And is also a doctorate in anthropology, research on impact of environmental degradation and climate change on tribal communities, MPhil in environmental science, and Masters of Environment Management. And our third panel speaker is Prerna Shah. She's a well-qualified and diligent development consultant with two years of consulting experience in the government sector. She is Senior Research Associate with International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. And she has completed her Master's of Philosophy, MPhil, in Development Studies from IIT Bombay and Master of Arts from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. From her graduation days in political science, she has been an active NSS volunteer and worked very closely on research and data analysis, along with drafting a report for CRI regarding the effectiveness of the RTEA. So over to Mr. Aditya Pundir, to chair the session and you know and to preside over this panel discussion with you know the speakers in serial order like Dr. Prabhulatel and then Selvan Jacob and Ms. Prema. So over to others. Uh, thank you, Vic. Uh, it was indeed a wonderful session listening to all the guests in the morning. And yes, it is a good start to the uh, function for the World Environment Day. But uh, I have some mixed feelings actually starting this session today. You know, in uh, 1972, when we did this uh, Stockholm conference happened and the World Environment Day was formed the next year, uh, there was a lot of hope that 50 years down now we are talking in 2022, things will change, people will know and a corrective actions would be taken. But unfortunately, what we see today on the ground is that climate change, I think we will have to now call it climate emergency everywhere. Because things are getting very serious, the way things are happening. And every day now we are moving towards the dangerous limits, as I would call it. IPCC in its new report has said that uh, we're going to touch 1.5 degrees, which is the limit set at Paris Agreement in next five years, which is, which is going to be a disaster. Secondly, if we want to maintain our targets of that remaining at 1.5 degrees, we will have to look at somewhere around emissions to be reduced to literally 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So 
these are the things I think the new realities which we are going to face now. And it's very important that all the people who are attending this webinar or people who are going to go and talk about it to other people, they understand this and they talk about it, that this is now not, as I said, it's not a discussion on environment any longer. It's more about climate emergency, which is happening everywhere. Now, as the windows is getting smaller, I think there's also a need that we have to also start working harder. And sustainable development, uh, as I rightly said, sustainable development, as Professor has explained, is now we have to also move beyond sustainable development. We have to move towards a climate adapted behavior or a climate resilient development with sustainable development, or as I will call it, the new word is adaptative, adaptative development. That's what we have to work towards because that is the new reality which we are living in. And here comes the rules of cooperatives. Now, as we know the cooperative world or the not-for-profit world or the people who are working uh, with something other than in mind, other than the money, this sector is very, very crucial in the coming times. The number one reason for this uh, sector to become very important is that it enjoys the trust of the beneficiaries. People who are being benefited by cooperatives, people who are coming in touch, for people for whom the government, governments of the world are designing policies. These people, unfortunately, despite the government's best intentions, somehow there's a difficulty in implementing the policies. There's a difficulty in getting the feedback, like the great things are being done by the government, but unfortunately, the right message is not reaching the capitals or the policy partners. And here is the role of our cooperatives. The cooperatives are, are the ones who are really working on the ground. Cooperatives are the ones who are actually working very closely with the beneficiaries, and they are the ones who, are, who have their confidence. So I think in the coming times, to get this transformation of uh, sustainable development fast enough, we will need to strengthen our cooperative networks. We will have to strengthen them. We will have to resource them. We will have to train them if required so that they can do both the processes. Number one, they can help in talking about the benefits, like making the user segments aware of what the policies are, what the benefits are being given to them, how they have to move forward in taking care of the environment, ecology, and the, and the equity part of the development. So all this thing can be explained to the user segment. And, and then, of course, the feedback, like, what would be the implication? How are they working out? Is the policy working? Is the policy not working? Is the policy benefiting the beneficiary? Or in somewhere in the middle, the money is getting lost and the policy is getting lost. So this feedback has to go to the top people again in the planning department who are working on it and who are going to tweak the policy for the benefit. So again, so I would say that the role of cooperative in the coming time is going to be extremely important the way they take the, because the messaging has to go both ways. So I think this is the one thing they will really do it well. Another benefit why the cooperatives have is they generally run on very low cost. They have the cost advantage. Being smaller in size, being, uh, being uh, uh, not having the overheads the bureaucracy has. And uh, the, so again, they are the ones which are having low cost of operation and they are able to, they're able to give that information benefit. All the things have can be done at a, low cost. So this is again something which is going to going in favor of the cooperatives. So I think it's there's a need, there's going to be a need for us to strengthen the cooperative network in the coming times. And now we have, as we know, we have some uh, uh, hardcore professionals like Praful is a hardcore person and he's done some uh, incredible work in Rayagada, probably one of the most uh, uh, prime minister's aspirational district and the most disadvantaged district. So Prafula has done some wonderful work out there and helped in bringing a huge transformation in that district. And then of course we have others, Dr. Salman is also there. He's again, is a, he's a veteran of a development in the last so many years. So I think we'll, I'm not going to take too much of time and we are going to listen from these professionals how they're taking it forward. So over to you, uh, Mr. Prafula for taking it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aditya ji and uh, in uh, organizing such an wonderful event. Am I audible, please? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, uh, is my, is it visible now? Is it visible? Hello? Yes. It's visible. My screen is visible? It's visible. Oh, it's visible. Okay. Um, at the outset, uh, I think uh, uh, Aditya ji has very nicely uh, explain the, the cooperatives role in transforming traditional communities and uh, 
uh, uh, particularly you know uh, most backward people in this uh, in this uh, country uh, i would like to share uh, i want to go to the theory but i so i would like to share some stories of transformation that has happened and let me just uh, briefly talk about the context i am working with as you all know odisha is uh, one of the poorest state in the country and the paradox is having only 4% of country's population uh, it is one of the highest high emitting state in the country almost 45% of total gdp of india region is primarily you know uh, thermal power stations and exploratory industries massive mining that takes place in this region second uh, most paradoxical situation is uh, frequent climate disaster that state uh, you know face it was previously every 10 year one now today every year two or three climate disasters and it become unbearable for the people to um, uh, i know face the disasters and uh, meet the loss the third most critical uh, uh you know uh, uh, factor and critical component of the state is highest poverty levels in spite of the highest level of reduction during last two decades still it is reeling a 30 percent of uh you know of population population are in abject poverty and uh, if you see these uh, factors uh, the current industrial and the economic model of the state is to reach 1 trillion dollar by 2030 mostly depending on uh, exploratory industries massive mining and all these things which need to be revisited and i am advocating that state should really you know uh, uh, relook the policy and uh, think otherwise and there is an opportunity as well 62% of state populations are huge in the age group of 15 to 45 years who can be the best climate warriors and climate action uh, taking populations of the state and 40% of the boundary which is again very critical question age coastal which is rising and increasing because of sea level rise every year uh, 4 mm uh, you know sea level rise having this context i started with five i i would like to share with you five stories and which can give you the indication what is uh, you know uh, what i am doing and primarily what the people around me around 30000 families of the state in three four districts are basically aiming for massive carbon sequestration and uh, from the atmosphere by 2030 and story one is the regeneration of forest through the bamboo story of uh, uh, you know there's a story of tribal girls women rejuvenation of bamboo based economy for forest regeneration and conservation to fight plastic and metal pollutions of uh, earth and generate new source of uh, employment and business opportunities for the aspirant youths as rightly said by aditya ji raigada you all know one of the aspirational district primarily because it is one of the district among 112 prime uh, 112 uh, aspirational districts in backward districts and one of the objective that youth should play a major role in you know uh, rebuilding the economy and uh, you know uh, seeing the economic prospects uh, uh, what i have done i have mobilized the youths into youth clubs and balika mandals women are the sgs and farmers are the farmer clubs and trying to give them a transformative sector the a sustainability sector the circular economy sector to build up their own economy and one of the success story here is bamboo jewelry and bamboo handicrafts in 2019 the story started like this i organized one of the international conference on bamboo uh, you know uh, sector economy in bhubaneswar in that international conference basically it was after prime minister of india has declared bamboo as a grass from previous status trees giving the uh, bamboo sector as the economic sector and uh, the you know uh, employment sector to the community so in that context one of the there is one of the uh, you know uh, one of the outcome was massive 
bamboo plantation came off at one exhibition, but in spite of the bamboo development authorities and boards, it was not taking off. It was not taking off simple reason it, because the, the bamboo based uh, you know, communities are not realizing the value after it become deregulated. So I have started, uh, you know, uh, starting with the bamboo jewelry. And as you all know that the plastic uh, replacement can be possible uh, uh, through the bamboo or the glasses, bamboo products, bamboo packaging, and uh, bamboo jewelry can replace the metal uh, sector. And experimentally, we invited the NIFT Bhubaneswar to uh, discover the tribal art and craft, take the bamboo as the you know, forest resource around, and uh, produce the bamboo jewelry. So we're very happy to know that within uh, these two years, the, uh, the, this economy growth uh, up to you know, you know, two crore rupees with 25 girls, and the demand are very high in international market. Recently, one of the American team came and they are going to sell across the world. And now, to two, 25 girls, the government came forward to join hands to the tribal development department, to the Orma, to the OLM, to the other people now giving the supports to make it 500 girls to uh, really depend on this thing. Every girl can have, I know, uh, 25 to 30,000 rupees per month as their salary. What has happened at the end of the day? The, the challenge that bamboo plantation or the bamboo conservation was not taken up. Once but, this uh, utilizes, uh, Arun, just once, can you yeah. get, make it a big screen like press F5? So, you know, part, participants are asking for, you know, making it a big screen. Can you press F5? Okay, you know, can you make it a Yeah. Yeah, fine. Okay, in this sector, now giving a new hope to the aspirational youths of Raigada to build up their career in the in a sector. And now the, uh, the this uh, rural startup is growing, and none other than the Odisha Skill Development Authority, the Government of India Skill Ministry, even Prime Minister, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kusal Jodana, uh, they they have also identified the green skill space. And now the sector is growing. What has happened at the end of the day that bamboo, the, the SHGs have come forward and asking for the bamboo plants to plant in the forest in their own land for this utilization. What has happened? The forest regeneration happened. Bamboo protection happened. The bamboo sector economy rejuvenated. The employment for the aspirational youths happened. So this is one story. I think uh, you can see this, how it is growing. I see that the sector can grow much uh, faster and go further. The second story I would like to share with you is the story of climate resilient, I know, uh, agriculture. Uh, primarily, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, you know, the disaster affected kind of things. When we came to uh, the, uh, to Raigada and Puri, Puri is one of the extreme because it faced the sea level rise and frequent natural disasters. Raigada is one of the mining zone where the agriculture is completely gone with the, cotton and other kind of things. So in this situation when I came and uh, one of the major problem was, you know, a small land holding with a, a water crisis and uh, 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 keeping that, I started an experimentation with, you know, massive you know, transformation of cropping pattern through a sustainable agriculture. Thing. So what has happened in these two years? I started with, uh, by giving that uh, solar micro pumps not by the groundwater. Groundwater initially failed because groundwater drastically goes down, so the uh, pumps become deformed. So then I started identifying the streams. As you know, the Raigada is one of the mountaineering zones and streams are perennial. So I started lifting the water from 200 feet down, giving the water off, and then spring sets started. And the chain of spring sets now gives the hope that a crop, a cotton crop, which was monotonous and the one crop in a year in eight months, now the farmers are getting three crops in place of cotton fields, and now they have gone all organic and in natural way. And this has given another boost to the whole program. When I have come to the PMK, so I Prime Minister Kishi Shichai Dozana, which is drip irrigation, and the, in the other uh, international national agency, the academic institutions like OUAT and other universities come forward and to study how it has happened. Just taking that thing, I have started another uh, new project called natural farming, 
and the target will be very happy to know that in natural farming, let me tell you, if climate action's objective is to sequest carbon uh, dioxide from the atmosphere, one of the major source of carbon sequestration in natural farming, in plowing 2,500 carbon we emit, in pesticides, five tons of carbon we emit per year, in fertilizers, five tons we do that, in that way, 2,500, 10, uh, uh, you know, a ton of carbon we emit every year per acre. So keeping that, we have taken a massive project with the government. I have, because this is the idea that government now take up and uh, joined with hand with us, Jagat Guru Purpal University, where I have started the School of Transformation and Sustainable Development, the JK Paper CSR, which has a fund, and now uh, government has joined and we are now planning to have, uh, convert 10 lakh hectares, 10 percent of the total agricultural land of Odisha by 2030 into natural farming. Fund technology and farm design, everything is going on. It has the effects of the water conservation, everything. You know, the net outcome, I can tell you that 5.2 billion carbon could be sequestered by converting 10% of the land. This is a very high call, but I see that 20 lakh uh, uh, you know, acres of land and 10 lakh farmers can be can join hands. I can tell you the success story in this. When I started in 2019 in Puri, farmers were not coming for uh, you know uh, tree plantations. Now, 15 farmers producer companies within two years with 7,000 farmers have joined me at, at networking to take up this natural farming. In this year, they are going massively in coming years. So the second story, what I would suggest that action is very important. And of course, theory debate that will go on, but context specific actions and leadership is the key. Thank you very much to Climate Reality and Aditya for helping me to and, and all uh, ways uh, for coming up on this. Thank you very much. Now let's come to the other, other things where I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have started in, in the context of uh, 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 funny super cyclone. After funny super cyclone, uh, uh, the Puri coast lost 15 million trees, only one district. And that has gave, uh, given, given huge challenge uh, to the district to, ad uh, to you know, adapt with the heat waves, also the, uh, you know, uh, other effects. Keeping that, we started uh, fruit tree plants in Odisha, the food, the food uh, sufficient and fruit deficit. And as you all know very rightly that uh, uh, Gitanjali was talking about, you know, Jogo, other things, the immunity and health and good food is, of course, very important for our life and will be living. But Odisha is one of the states, uh, the fruit deficit massively, you know, affect the, uh, you know, consumption sector. So I have started this fruit tree plantation. Uh, thanks a lot to the green, uh, the climate reality and uh, uh, sustainable green initiative. Given the initial one lakh trees, now up to uh, in these two years, eight point three lakh trees been planted. Out of that, two point five lakh are the fruit trees, and six lakh trees are casuarina and mangrove, which is protecting the sea coast. And this year we are also going to do that. And these farmers crops. Uh, our farmers, uh, producer companies are taking three plants and a spo, and others are, uh, you know, uh, ancillary activities at the farmers producer companies. So we are planning to have a 2030 10 million trees. It's a big call, but I'm getting a lot of support so we can achieve that. Third story. This is the fourth story is about the leadership in connecting tribal with the forest to supplies and economy. As you all know that during pandemic, when supply disrupted, but the agriculture and forest sector did not affected a lot. The reason that women have started, you know, uh, you know, uh, doing the packaging, see the brooms, grass, the tamarind, the siali leaves, the, you know, uh, high curcumin, uh, turmeric. So they all have started doing the things and I have now stood up with 30 cottage industries with the women owned only. 10,000 women are now trying to be part of these things. And this has created a new economy it's not consumption, it's a wealth creation sector. This is another story which I can share in detail later. And this is again, I can tell you that the leadership in climate education, uh, be it uh, CC University, be it uh, you know, Birla Global University, be it Utkal University, or be it now currently uh, you know, uh, Jagadur Kopal University. I used to go there and I, I was trained in 2012 
uh, by Algar. Uh, thanks a lot to Mr. Kundir. And we have been trained in San Francisco by now. 3,700 lectures I have already given. And these campuses are coming up. The Green Campus Program, we're very happy that in Buraigada, 12 schools, 9,000 students are now part of the Green Campus Program. In many schools, we have already, you know, uh, 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 the green coverage, the rainwater harvesting, the uh, solar panels and everything. Recently, we have given the paper recycling machine from the, you know, collaboration with the industries. So this is another transformation is happening and massive youths are coming forward, youth for SDG. And now in university level, we are giving the, uh, you know, uh, industrial decarbonation was the major concern in spite of all the things. And the industrial decarbonation process is very slow. The expression is very slow. And in spite of that, they have uh, this shortage of professionals to take it out. So now corporate environmental responsibility, corporate social responsibility, having this sustainable sector economy in the you know, uh, corporate level and uh, uh, professionals, we have been taking the classes in all these uh, you know, universities. Having said that, this is our outreach. I'm expecting that we can do the things. See the Shiali leaf, the women are building the things. One core Shiali leaf, they are now going to a Shiali leaf plate, going to make this year. And we have got a demand from Germany and USA and other places for this uh, Shiali leaf because, as you know, the millionaire behaviors are different. This is our SAG footprints. I'm not going to the details, but my uh, uh, takeaway, the last point is there also the dialogue perspective. So I'm just sharing some of the pictures with you with uh, how livelihood, uh, climate uh, uh, action, climate resilient agriculture, everything are, uh, you know, uh, go in one uh, uh, go. And these are the things, this is the group based enterprise. So women power, I see that a lot of women, uh, women can really contribute enough for uh, conservation of forest biodiversity. And they have to be given the chance they, once they get proof, they start uh, connect the forest to their livelihood. Nobody can stop it. That is what has happened in the case of bamboo. The forest ranger asked them not to give bamboo for their bamboo handicrafts and jewelry. They started planting bamboo and protecting bamboo uh, in the forest itself. So now this, these are the experience and uh, I uh, go through at the SHG and uh, women producer groups, as I said previously. Now these are, let's see the rural march. You know, you know, supply chain, unless you uh, link the economy to the environment, whatever you may say, it may not run. So here I have, we have made it very clearly as a leader that how environment uh, and economy and sustainable sector, circular economy sector, and all the national development goals can be localized in our actions. That's what exactly has happened. Youth engagement, you see the bamboo jewelry they have been doing. And... Uh, then I can see the digital learning centers. We have given them computer educations and computer education has given them exposure to the knowledge and they have been taking it up massively. I just share the things. I, I have papers for uh, detailed papers. I can share with other, but these are my presentations because time is less. Farm-based livelihoods, you see, this is what I'm going to share the success to the banana. These are the field, previously uh, cotton fields. In the cotton fields, uh, you know, farmers, uh, because of low small holding, farmers generally do their labor in their own hand, own land, and get nothing. Now, in same lands, per acre, they're earning six lakh rupees by doing called banana, and they don't have to go, go for input cost uh, in three years. If they can plant once, they can, that can grow three years, and the soil health maintained very well. And they don't give any uh, any manure or any pesticide in it. So as I said to you that if you can convert one acre of land from synthetic and chemical fertilizer to organic, you can sequest almost 2510 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is what happened. Hundreds of acres of land and hundreds of farmers have taken up. And government has given a lot of support and the idea has been adapted and uh, taken by the government for its propagations massively in the tribal areas. So another thing, this is the rural hut. And the rural hut, uh, people used to come and uh, give like farmers resource center and uh, solar micro pumps, everything. See how the farmers have been using solar micro pumps. And uh, the farms have been completely changed. These are the products. It's giving a complete differ, different transmissions. 
Aditya was here and she has seen in his own eyes. And what I suggest here is, uh, I think uh, this is another uh, social capital formations. So my submission here is, uh, um, you know, uh, while we are putting the transition uh, from Dati uh, or the, you know, we put the you know, effort on transition, we also think the new economic models like circular economy and sustainable sector economy. Women, farmer and youths in the rural area, the remotest of remote area can contribute enough for the carbon situation, which people generally say that probably, you know, agriculture or other people may not do the thing, but this is what is happening in Odisha. This is what I would like to share with you. I would expect more and more youths should come forward and take it up to the village and we can uh, get our green environment and save our planet. Thank you very much. It's fine. Thank you, Dr. Prafull. And now may I invite Dr. Selvan Jacob on the panel, please. Then we can have a few question answers which we have documented from the registrations. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aditya. And thank you, Bhavesh, for having me on this uh, webinar. It's always a privilege and a joy to uh, catch up with uh, uh, good friends. And as we have collaborated earlier as well, it's a, uh, really a good uh, opportunity to uh, come back and uh, uh, on this panel and share some of our experiences. Um, I hope my slide is visible now. No, you know, it's just say, yeah, fine, fine. And it's come. Okay, I'll just put it on uh, full screen. Is it up? Okay. Great. So thank you once again, and uh, I'll keep it uh, um, short. And my focus will be on the need for collective action uh, for sustainable development. And I, I would, uh, you know kind of follow on with what uh, Dr. Prafulla mentioned, a good friend, uh, and also on, on the points which uh, Aditya mentioned about the need for you know, collective action, uh, on the ground action on the things, because it is no longer about the, uh, the, the, the science about climate change. It is a time for action. It's a time of emergency and for all of us to be working on, on some of those immediate things that can be done at short term and also uh, with a long-term perspective where work can be started uh, now uh, at present. So World Vision India, where I work, is uh, you know, uh, having its footprint across the country. I just have a slide to just give you a glimpse about uh, 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 this work of ours. And uh, so we have a footprint in, in 25 states across the country where we work on various development programs including the climate change mitigation adaptation programs, which covers 140 districts. And work, we work with uh, 6,000 odd communities on ground. And World Vision India is a child-focused organization. So a lot of our programs are focused on children. And we impact about 2.6 million children and their families uh, in the country. Uh, so this is achieved through uh, about 118 long-term development programs that we have. And on the map, you can see the locations where we are presently having our projects across the country. And we monitor them through uh, uh, six of our monitoring uh, offices based in six locations across the country, as I have just highlighted over here. So um, as I mentioned that our focus primarily is on children and, uh, and our programs drive primarily on the issues around children um, and, and then also then to build the ecosystem around the children that will enable the sustainable development of the children. And uh, climate change therefore is, is a key priority for us as 
it is going to impact not only us, but our children and, and their future. And uh, we have a developed number of programs around uh, uh, children and their sensitization and efforts on that. Just to give you a glimpse of what are the things that we do, because the reason is that we want to really groom and nurture the children and the generation that is coming up that is going to be you know, driving the economy and everything else to have uh, an understanding of the importance of environmental conservations, protection, and, and developing it. The importance of giving priority to, to an economy which is environmentally friendly, which is low carbon, which is carbon neutral, and also ways of how we can nurture it in terms of you know, various other aspects of biodiversity and, and the overall ecosystem um, of building and nurturing. So we have a number of programs on sensitizing. As we understand, the key thing is around sensitizing, creating awareness among the masses, but we have focused on children where we have a number of workshops, audiovisual presentations. We have materials like activity books uh, where children get to do things with their hand, the activity books around helping children understand the importance of plants and trees, where they, where they not only plant trees or saplings, but also interact with elders and teachers and schools to understand the, the value of those trees and plants in their own communities, in their own villages, be it in terms of their commercial value, in terms of their uh, medicinal value, how they are used, and, uh, and various other things related to those plants. And that enables them to have, uh, you know, get their hands dirty, learn with fun kind of an approach. We also have comic booklets uh, that again help children to understand, of course, the science of climate change, why it is happening, how it's going to impact them, their families, and most importantly, what are the ways in which the children and common people, their own families can contribute in, in small little ways in which they, they contribute towards addressing the issues of climate change and improving environmental protection and conservation efforts. Now, as I mentioned, children are also encouraged to participate in tree plantations uh, in their own community, in their own uh, backyards, of, in their own homes, in their premises of their homes, in, in habitation areas. So th that is part of the children clubs that we have formed in all of these. As I mentioned, we have presently about 118 projects and all of these projects, we form children clubs, children groups. That is uh, a platform where children learn with fun uh, uh, on various important issues, including the issues of environment, climate change, what is it, how is it, what they can do. So um, in the year 2019-20, the year we, we had children plant about one lakh, one, more than one lakh saplings, and then they are the ones who nurture them for at least for some time, and then the community also come together to, to nurture them. So uh, of course, the last two years, we, we, we didn't have a lot of programs, but uh, because of the whole issues of COVID and things like that. But uh, again, uh, and as I mentioned, um, yeah. So more than one lakh saplings were planted and then children interact or through various ways to understand traditional knowledge of these trees and plants which they're trying to nurture. And uh, uh, in the current year, we again are working out uh, on the way towards sensitizing one lakh more children, primarily on climate change and its issues through different IEC materials, audiovisual programs through these platforms. The point is to groom children as change agents in communities uh, and in their own homes. Now, what happens? Now, children uh, lead various rallies in their own villages, in their own communities, as you can also see in one of those pictures. But uh, they are the ones who are sensitizing their own communities on various environmental issues. Let's say saying no to plastics or saying no to crackers and things like that. And we have seen that in these communities, when children are in the ones who uh, you know, run a kind of a signature campaign and children are the ones telling their parents, we do not want crackers this time because they, we understand that we would like to you know, uh, 
protect and conserve our air and our earth and our nature. And they look at other things uh, to celebrate, we, to be part of the celebration rather than uh, things that are not so environment friendly. So those are things that we have seen. Uh, we also conducted a virtual children consultation from uh, projects across, our con across the country where children are you know, sharing about their concerns, their suggestions on what are the things that we can do um, towards uh, environmental protection in our programming and even otherwise by collaboration with other, uh, um, you know, other stakeholders. And we have tried to publish them uh, you know, share their voices to the wider stakeholders through these consultations. And as we have groomed these children, children have now have the understanding of the importance. They are now confident enough to speak. And this year, you know, as we all know, we, we had the global platform on uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, and we had two of our children speak in these in these consultations at the Asia Pacific regional level, which you know uh, form the inputs for from the children and youths towards these uh, uh, you know high level meetings that happen in the GPDRR. So children spoke at these platforms. We have children in uh, you know in Delhi from our children clubs speak in the Delhi Assembly premises, the program organized by the, uh, the Delhi Assembly, and we have children share their concerns and views with the. The, the elected members of the uh, Delhi Legislative Assembly. And yesterday, in fact, uh, the children from our communities in, in Delhi received uh, a recognition of their efforts towards environmental protection from the uh, District Magistrate of Northeast Delhi uh, on, on the program that they had organized yesterday on the occasion of the Environment Day. So again, a recognition of, of that the people want to listen to what children want to say. And uh, in fact, uh, tomorrow, again, Two of our children speaking in the Kerala State Assembly program organized by the uh, Kerala State Assembly along with the uh, UNICEF, where children from our communities again speak to the uh, elected members in the Kerala State Assembly. So the, the point I'm driving is there is a need for sensitizing not only the masses, but children are the people, uh, the children and youth, there's a great potential to take collective action where their, their minds are groomed where we are able to inculcate in them the values that they need to prioritize the importance of environmental protection. So children as change agents in communities. Uh, and uh, well, these are some pictures of the materials that we developed for helping children understand the importance of climate change in various uh, you know, uh, materials, yeah. Uh, the other thing, another important uh, issue that we all know is, uh, regeneration of the degraded lands. Now, land degradation is definitely, as of today, one of India's most, uh, you know, pressing environmental problem. And uh, a total of 97 million hectares of land is degraded in the country, and which is a massive, massive area which needs immediate attention. And as we know that, uh, you know, the government of India as part of the Paris Agreement have made commitments, uh, you know, of, of about 2.5 to 3.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, of, um, uh, to, to be, you know, sequestered through the forest that can be regenerated by 2030. And recently we have also heard uh, Honorable Prime Minister uh, giving the commitment that 26 million hectares of land, of degraded land will be regenerated by the year 2030. So there is a, a need for collective action in this area and uh, where, the, where the government is definitely interested and there are various other stakeholders who can come together to regenerate these, these degraded lands, which are extremely key when you talk about, um, you know, uh, not just climate mitigation, also adaptation and sequestration of carbon um, uh, from our uh, uh, atmosphere, from our, from our environment. So we at World Vision uh, in the last uh, couple of years have been working on a small area, not huge, but 158 hectares of land um, in, in Sagar and Gunnur, Karir, Nagpur, these areas. And we are trying to regenerate these degraded lands through uh, different models. And we have tried to use uh, globally, uh, uh, kind of recognized model called as FMNR, Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration, 
which is a community-led natural environmental regeneration uh, model, which is a low-cost model, which, is, which primarily focuses around selective pruning of live tree stems, uh, which is also in some ways similar to the assisted forest regeneration model, which the, the forest departments also use in some of the uh, degraded forest lands, and plus plantation initiatives, and improving surface water bodies and groundwater recharging initiatives. And uh, we have in these areas also uh, constructed a number of uh, uh, community ponds and farm ponds that uh, improve the availability of surface water for, for their own irrigational needs, the recharging of groundwater. We've also uh, kind of installed a lot of rooftop rainwater facilities in these, uh, in these areas. Climate smart agriculture, again, uh, a point which I take from uh, uh, Mr. Proful, who just mentioned about these things. Uh, climate, we, we are presently working with around 900 farmers and we have been able to see uh, improved productivity as well as economic benefits uh, in their lives through the uh, integrated approach through these climate smart agriculture methodologies that they have been adopting. So this is a key area where there is a lot of need for collective action. And when we look at the tribal areas, which are again located in the forest lands, buffer areas of forest, there's a huge opportunity to build their livelihoods based on minor forest produce, uh, which at present may not be you know, fully developed. So there is a need for improving their the product quality, strengthening of the local nature-based products that may be available, but they have not really uh, meeting the standards of the local markets. So establishing market linkages and things like that. Now, one of the picture there, we, we can see that a, a person has made leaf plates, you know. So today the trend is of uh, plastic plates, use and throw. Uh, well, these are things that the traditional knowledge that we already have, mainly with the tri tribal communities, we could enhance the quality of them, we can strengthen it further, provide market linkages. So there is a, a lot of opportunity. It could be honey, it could be, it could be uh, medicines, it could be wild fruits, many other things that can be developed uh, where there is a lot of need for collective action. And there are some of the other pictures on this slide, you can see where we are regenerating some of these degraded lands through the models of CLNER or FMNR, also the water bodies that have been created again, making a lot of impact in those areas. Uh, let me just move to the next slide. Yeah. yeah, the other one where I feel there is a lot of scope for collective action is the uh, access to clean energy in the rural area. And we did have a lot of discussions around this in the past as well. And, uh, uh, you know, it, the fact still remains irrespective of a lot of uh, good initiatives and programs by different uh, you know, stakeholders, primarily from the government and others, that a significant section of the rural community still depend on biomass as their primary source of cooking energy. And uh, interestingly, even uh, the, according to the Forest Survey of India report in 2020, about 85,000 tons of firewood is still being used across India uh, you know, as, as firewood for their cooking needs, So, which is phenomenally huge. And we need to look at ways and means of how we can address this issue. Now, there is a need for providing multiple options for clean energy. And, uh, but the key definitely lies in the fact that it needs to be affordable, it needs to be easily accessible, and, and needs to be sustainable, uh, and which can happen only through a collective action. And, uh, in our own efforts through World Vision Give, we, we tried to um, help 15,000 households switch to cleaner cooking practices in the operational villages where we work. Uh, now, this is in the form of fuel efficient cook stoves. Uh, also, there are other things that we have done, like the use of biogas, and which definitely enable you know, reduction in emission levels, improving indoor air quality reducing vulnerability of the you know, childhood related illnesses, be it, you know, various illnesses that are associated with indoor air pollution and things like that. A lot of benefits, economic benefits, environmental benefits, there is a huge need for collective action. Now, the, the opportunities could be in the form of local bioenergy units, be it 
uh, be it biogas, be it, uh, uh, be it energy from waste, be it from rice husk based energy production. So many opportunities are there, but of course that needs to be affordable and sustainable, which can always create a lot of uh, rural employment, um, income generation act things through these uh, initiatives that can be done. So again, flagging of one of the things that can form, you know, which needs collective action, definitely would uh, reap environmental benefits, climate benefits with this. So these are some of the key thoughts that I thought I can place before uh, uh, all of you, which is key in terms of um, uh, collective action, which can really help in contributing towards the larger efforts of climate change mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Back to you, Aditya. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. And uh, it's a beautiful presentation and wonderful in the way that how children are being involved. I'm amazed, you know, like, you know, they are participating in Kerala Assembly in Delhi State. It's wonderful. So let us have, you know, another speaker like ahead, Ms. Prerna Shah. And uh, like, I'm a little hesitant in, you know, in making, you know, like a stop over to speaker. So may I request Prerna to be, you know, with her time limit so that, you know, the rest of the speakers, which are, you know, in waiting ahead sessions so, so that we can finish in time and take questions as well. Like we have questions for session one also. So I'll take those questions to the speakers a little later. Over to Prerna. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Prerna Shah and I'm a research, senior research associate with uh, the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me uh, to join in as a panelist uh, on this very esteemed uh, panel. Um, so what, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, of course, audible. Yeah, all right, great. Uh, so basically I'd like to um, talk about our study, which is on uh, Tendupatta collection uh, practices in India. Um, and looking at, we look at the economic and environmental aspects, uh, why we need to phase out the Intupatta collection and how more sustainable livelihoods can be promoted. Um, so as you all know that the Intupatta or uh, the Tendu leaf is uh, used in the manufacture of uh, BD, which is the Indian cigarette. And why we're pushing for a phase out is namely in light of its uh, environmental impact um, through its contribution towards forest fires and carbon emissions and um, not to mention its contribution towards uh, BD manufacture and um, its concomitant uh, adverse health impact. Uh, so basically the study assesses the environmental and economic aspects of the Indipata collection in, in our focus states, uh, uh, which are Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh and Orissa. And we have done some analysis um, of the environmental impact through satellite data analysis and modeling. And I shall come to the findings a little later. Uh, so, so basically, uh, so since the panel discussion is on the role of cooperatives, um, I shall begin with my remarks on um, the economic aspects of Tendu collection and the role of decentralized governance and grounds of our federation in this. Um, so just to give you a, a, a background, so we have an average of three lakh metric tons of Tendu production uh, in 2017, uh, according to MOA, in the top 13 Tendu Pata producing uh, states in the country. Um, and the Tendupata trade is a nationalized one uh, with the um, forest departments taking over the trade in, in 60s and 70s. Um, after the uh, FRA Act of uh, 2006, you have communities that have been recognized uh, in terms of the rights of ownership and sale of uh, non-timber forests produced like Tendupata. Um, so this was a paradigm shift uh, uh, you know, taken to protect tribals and empowering them in the trade of uh, NTFPs. Um, so you have states like Maharashtra that have deregulated the trade of Tindulis. And what we find is that you have uh, Gram Sabhas uh, in areas like Gatchiroli or Chandrapur that have been uh, exercising their rights of harvesting and selling uh, Tindulis um, after claiming community forest uh, resource rights. And um, Talking about a cooperative structure, we find that several Gram Sabhas, for instance, in Chandrapur district, have federated to uh, form a Gram Sabha uh, federation, and they have post uh, claiming their CFR rights. And you have them directly um, auctioning to sell their team. 
And what this essentially does is to um, ensure that they have better uh, uh, sort of returns on, on the produce that they're selling. And also we find that in CFR areas, because they claim rights over uh, the forest produce, over uh, the forests, they have a stake in conserving uh, their area. And, and which, which, which I think is very important. Um, yeah, uh, so, but we also need to, while, while I do acknowledge that cooperatives are a good way, especially in CFR areas to sort of ensure that uh, the communities get adequate returns uh, on their produce. What we also need to sort of get into is what sort of produce needs to be promoted. So we find that there, for instance, Tendupatta, we find that um, while it is a lucrative source of income for many of these communities, um, we find through our studies that there is a direct correlation between uh, forest fires and Tendupatta collection. Uh, so, uh, so what our data shows is that um, around between the uh, years uh, 2011 and 2021, uh, 13,000 square kilometers of forest area uh, was burnt, which is roughly equivalent to the size of Bahamas. And this is a huge number. And this is in the states, in the three states of Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, and Orissa. And these three states collectively account for around 35% of the total uh, Tindu leaves collected in the country. Um, also in the year 2021, in these uh, three states, you have 14.2 million metric tons of CO2 emissions, uh, which is uh, equivalent to emissions made by 5.6 million cars in a year. And why is this important? Uh, this is important because, so we have rising forest fire incidences in the country. A uh, study suggests that forest fire incidences have gone up tenfold in the last two decades. And you have, even as per uh, the FSI data, you see that forest, fire ha uh, forest fires have gone up. Um, and why, so fires are used basically to stimulate better growth of uh, Tendu leaves and to support production of BDs. So there is an urgent need to sort of do away with uh, unsustainable uh, 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 practices uh, like this to sort of help phase out uh, collection of Tintupata because um, as, as Fundi sir said that we are uh, in, a, in an age of climate crisis and you, you know, our research shows that there's a significant relationship between forest fires and Tintupata collection practices. You have significant, uh, significant uh, CO2 emissions and it's necessary because forest fires uh, definitely contribute towards um, um, climate change. And uh, so, yeah, so I think I'd like to uh, end my uh, discussion by saying that while cooperatives are the way forward to, uh, to ensure, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic growth for communities, but we also need to see what kind of um, NTFPs need to be promoted and to sort of also keep in mind the environmental impact of uh, um, collecting such products. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Prerna. And uh, we have a set of questions online as well, and we have also got you know two emails. But we'll take questions a little later, just I have earlier shared. And I'll move on to another session, panel two, that is 2030 Global Agenda, Role of Youth in Empowerment, uh, Environmental Sustainability. And the session and the panel discussion will be chaired by Dr. Jiang, and whom I have already introduced in the inaugural session. And he was a key speaker during the session. So we have other two panelists, Dr. Bayun. He's a professor of public administration at Inha University, South Korea from 2003 to present. And he received TMA degree in urban planning from Seoul National University in Korea and PhD in urban planning from University of Pennsylvania, US. He was a research fellow at Korea Environment Institute and served as the president of Korea Environmental Policy and Administration Society. And he was the president of Urban Environmental Committee of, yes, I think I have repeated it. And he has published 15 books, including environmental policy. And Professor Seo, he studied at Korean history at Seoul National University and then received his PhD degree in sociology from the University of Essex, UK, 
and he had worked for the Democracy Institute of the Sung Hun He University as a research professor from 2008 to 11. Since 2012, he has been teaching at the sociology department of the Jeju National University. The title of PhD, his thesis, PhD thesis was the theoretical reflections from the radical Greater London Council, 1981 to, uh, sorry, yeah, and its implication for the British New Left. His research interests begin with British New Left movement and local politics, and after finishing the thesis, developed into environmental sociology. He published many environmental sociology, urban sociology, social theory, political sociology, and I will hand over this session to Professor Dai Yun Jiang to chair the session, and he will make his... Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, I, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks very much for your uh, participation. The specific theme of this session is the role of youth in environmental uh, sustainability. As we know, the roles by groups in relation to environmental sustainability has been first discussed at the Rio Summit Environmental Conference held in 1992 under the theme of Agenda 21. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, okay, in this context, the theme of this section is the role of youth in promoting sustainable, uh, environmental sustainability in a narrow sense and sustainable development in a broader sense. Okay, then uh, we have two uh, scholars from uh, Korea. Uh, as, uh, all of you have been introduced. Uh, Professor Byun, uh, uh, please uh, present your paper first uh, uh, for 10 minutes. Okay, would you please start? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay, you got okay. the full uh, full screen. Uh, you start, yes. please. Okay. Mm. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Byung Sol Byun, uh, professor of Inha University. Uh, I served uh, as the uh, president of uh, Incheon Green Union. Uh, I'm currently a member of uh, Green Union's Paris Committee. Today, uh, uh, I'm going to share the teenagers and the citizens' activities uh, to uh, preserve ecosystem uh, in Incheon. Uh, uh, okay, I'd like to start uh, with Jeyang Mountain uh, in Incheon. Uh, this mountain is the uh, uh, central mountain of Incheon. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it has the uh, high conservation value. Uh, however, uh, Lotte Group announced that, uh, its plan to build a golf course here. Uh, citizens uh, opposed uh, the construction of golf course on uh, Mount Geyang. Uh, eventually, the golf course construction plan was cancelled. Uh, the citizens protected Geyang Mountains. Now, teenagers and citizens are demanding uh, the citizens' national park. Uh, so, it is uh, requested to establish a protection plan uh, for the entire uh, Geyang Mountain. Also in Incheon, uh, there are two national rivers, Arachon and Gulpochon, and 30 local rivers and about 100 small rivers. Uh, Incheon is a city of water. 
but it is uh, dry because it is covered with concrete and asphalt. Uh, also, it is necessary to restore the river. Uh, we need to work for uh, water cycle. So we are working hard to uh, serve the river. Uh, in chance, uh, also wetland is a uh, ecologically excellent place here endangered species such as cranes, alak tailed mado, and uh, white footed crabs live. Uh, wetlands are the uh, natural resource in Incheon. Uh, activities are being carried out to protect natural resources from uh, disappearing. In particular, uh, wet protection week is set for protection activities. And I'd like to mention about wild animals and plants. Uh, there are many endangered uh, wildlife living in Incheon. Every month, uh, endangered wildlife is selected uh, to inform uh, endangered wildlife that we should cherish and care about. A uh, spotted seal uh, comes to Bengyeongdo uh, Island every year uh, in order to high, um, in order to help uh, spotted seals rest safely in Incheon. Uh, we will protect uh, spotted seals and uh, purify uh, their habitats. Uh, so once a month, uh, we consider safety of uh, endangered wild animals uh, with our members. We share the issues that uh, endangered wild animals face together and check their habitats to ensure their endangered wildlife are safe. And uh, I'd like to mention about the living environment. Uh, actually, in the invisible ground, in chance to land a uh, uh, to due to landfill and the soil pollution. Uh, people are in, engaged in activities to uh, preserve the soil and the habitat of our life. We should pay a lot of attention uh, to the restoration of uh, contaminated soil. Uh, the Green Union uh, continues to request for soil uh, restoration. Also, uh, the problem is uh, waste. The reduced waste and the sick sustainable resources uh, circulation society, uh, it is conducting a monitoring and campaign to solve the waste problem in Incheon. It is educating teenagers uh, to act as a res uh, resource uh, circulation readers. Uh, also, Incheon has uh, various sources of dust, including uh, industrial complexes and uh, airports and ports and uh, metropolitan landfill. <laughs> Uh, policy proposals and monitoring are being implemented to reduce dust. Uh, actually, uh, also the climate change, uh, maybe teenagers and the citizens uh, uh, propose their uh, climate change uh, policies, uh, maybe actually five days ago election. Uh, so they proposed the uh, policies to uh, mayor candidates. So due to the climate crisis, mankind is facing a crossroads of survival. We are, we are learning about the changes in the Incheon ecosystem. Uh, due to the climate crisis. 
and the conduct solidarity uh, ecosystem. Uh, the solidarity activities for energy conservation, uh, such as fossil uh, energy. So finally, uh, I'd like to mention about the ecological education. So many people are uh, play uh, excitedly in the forests and the parks of their area, and they meet trees, flowers, and uh, grass bugs. So maybe kids watch uh, the natural environment and uh, uh, life changing according to the changes of the season from spring to winter, winter and understand the natural environment around our neighborhood and develop ecological sensitivity. Uh, it is held once a month. Uh, also, uh, Incheon um, has the, a lot of uh, wetland. So Incheon's ecologically uh, mayor uh, land, uh, wetlands are uh, monitored uh, with uh, future generations of teenagers. Uh, they observe and uh, talk about uh, wetlands. Uh, they change by season and year. Uh, it is held once a month in uh, Yongjong Island in Korea, Incheon. Uh, also, uh, Incheon uh, has a big uh, river uh, called the uh, Gulpochon uh, stream, uh, the highest stream in Incheon. So observe and understand the changes in the Incheon River uh, through activities such as water quality uh, activity. And uh, uh, while monitoring activities uh, naturally share concerns about the importance and the necessity of uh, river preservation and uh, find ways on our own. Uh, after uh, completing uh, professional training uh, for uh, nature uh, guides, uh, they work uh, as a volunteer teacher uh, in green ecological education. Uh, we are thinking about uh, better ecological education and working together <coughs> on environmental conservation activities uh, such as MPBN monitoring. Uh, it uh, strengthens the intern, internal and external expertise uh, for uh, prospective forest uh, uh, commentators and uh, provide this uh, professional training theory and uh, uh, in terms of a field. So it's time to get out of the city and uh, indulge in nature and uh, make my own life. In summer, uh, they play in the water excitedly and in winter, uh, they live to find uh, uh, traces of uh, wild animals. Uh, youth uh, people also explore uh, the flag, flagpole species in Incheon. Uh, this is an activity with Sun uh, In High School, High School's Environmental Club. Uh, various types of uh, ecological education <clears throat> are provided in connection with schools and clubs and uh, institutions. Okay, I shared the uh, uh, youth activities uh, with Incheon uh, Green Union. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Thanks a lot, Professor Bjorn, for your presentation. Uh, as we have, uh, we have heard, uh, he presented a case of youth activities eh, implemented in Incheon City, South Korea, for environmental sustainability. Uh, he, according to his presentation, the youth activities carved uh, four sectors. Eh? Uh, the four sectors are the activities on ecosystem conservation, wild animals and the plant, living environmental, climate change, and ecological education. Okay, uh, once again, thanks a lot for your presentation. Next, uh, Professor So Young Pyo, uh, your turn. Would you please present your paper? Put down the, the PDF file. Mm. Professor Bion. Mm. Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, wait, wait a second. Professor, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. I'm sharing the, my my the PPT file. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Yong Pyo So, as uh, Professor Chung introduced. Uh, actually, I'm not empirically oriented researcher. So my talk uh, today's talk is. Uh, uh, quite a theoretical issue, so it's, it, I, I'm, I'm the, uh, afraid of being uh, a bit boring to everybody. But anyway, uh, my uh, theme is a new paradigm of politics, economic life. I think is a, there is a must be a, a, a bit more fundamental uh, reflection of our way of life and economic life and political system. So I, I'm. I'm Today, I will discuss what must be changed for the transition to green society and what is the task of, the, of in particular use in, in this historical, actually is not just the historical, cultural, economic, and social and political shift. I'm talking about that. Uh, next, sorry. Oh, it. Yeah, it's a brief introduction. Uh, a bit more detailed, the theme on which I focus are, first of all, the multiple crises, uh, among which the colored crisis is our main concern. These uh, uh, plural crises jeopardize the ordinary people's life, in particular, endanger the use, the existential condition of life. All of them have experienced frustration and discontent and are now attempting to find ways of resistance. Then I will try to criticize the prejudice produced by the mainstream economics grounded in modern paradigm of knowledge. I would argue the theoretical resources of this kind of critique has been provided by the so-called heterodox economics, including ecological and feminist economics. Now, we must change the criteria to measure economic prosperity from profit taking to need satisfaction. Through this change, we can achieve a fully realized democratic uh, partic uh, participation and planning. Uh, that, kind of, that is uh, comparable with a sustainable development. Uh, we are living in the era of multiple crises. First of all, all over the world has suffered from economic crisis, which was dramatically expressed, expressed in the financial crisis 2008 to nine. After it, the people have been suffering from austerity. Second, politics has been uh, important to respond to the economic crisis, rather was the quality of life. Actually, politics has, uh, uh, has been commodified and as a result, democratic representation has been eroded. Political crisis inevitably caused a social crisis. The citizens in political communities do not believe in political responsibility and cannot accept the existing order as a legitimate. It is a, it is a legitimation crisis called by William Habermas. In some sense, ecological crisis resulted from these crises 
and now abrupt with them put the planet Earth into deep catastrophe. I would argue that the present circumstance gives us a chance to realize uh, the uh, urgent the historical task of social change. Uh, next, in terms of philosophical anthropology, in these conditions, all of us who are biological and uh, uh, bodily vulnerable and psychologically unstable being from the beginning and does need the social bond for survival, lost, actually lost to the social solidarity. That is the ground of good life. The society in which we are living stigmatized the bond and solidarity as a sign of incompetence and dependence while seeking the egoistic interest. All of us are seeking uh, uh, egoistic interest. All of us fail to get our one history and narrative that make us <clears throat> who we are. The only way of being recognized is winning the game, which actually means defeating the others without whom each of us have difficulty constituting the identity. Always we are find identity, uh, constitute, to, uh, can constitute our identity among the community and the sharing culture. But we uh, that kind of culture destroyed by the logic of capital, capitalism. We are losing our self-respect as well as the social solidarity. Next, there is a the, the, uh, huge uh, 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 amorphous discontent accumulated. The so-called neoliberal economic system multiplies the discontent, but they are amorphous. The young generation is suffering from unstable future, insecure jobs, and this competition, poverty, polarization, and so on and so on. The youth in our period are poorer than a previous generation. Unfortunately, unfortunately, however, the youth is being frustrated and discontented, don't know how to organize the discontent in politics and how to resist it collectively. They have been raised and educated in the era of neoliberalism, in which power and merit were sort of the virtue. That's a tragic uh, situation. Uh, in this competitive society and meritocracy, the rules of game have been unjust, but challenging it seems to be cost and burden. Even if unintended, most of people have to be free riders. All of us have been forced to be an isolated atom that actually meant a competing machine. It was ground of populist politics instigating the hate among the losers in the neoliberal games. All social phenomena and background I mentioned could be the moment through which we can realize the urgent need of fundamental social transformation. From the above discussion, I would suggest that there should be deep crisis of modernity itself. Modern paradigm of knowledge suppose that scientific knowledge must be represented or expressed as dot, lines, functions, and graphs on the coordinate. A world is deep and complex structure, but modern paradigm of science made it flat. In this paradigm, we can, cannot see the cause of the economy, political, social, cultural, and most importantly, ecological crisis. In this sense, this paradigm is the cause of the uh, crisis. So I would argue that neoclassical mainstream economics, which is dominating our lives and the core of the above mentioned modern scientific paradigm made us fail to understand, explain the ecological crisis, including climate change and pandemic. In theoretical framework of neoclassical classics, there is no crisis, always equilibrium. Economic logic presupposes the economic actor, homo economicus, and imposes the price on the beings that cannot be estimated by it. As a result, we are forced to be forced ignore the significance and care, social reproduction, nature, and life itself. There has been the big debate on the limit of mainstream economics. The critic and then new ideas from it have been provided by ecological economics and the feminist economics. They argue now that the goal of economics must be defined as carrying people's life rather than quantitative growth. The focus must shift from profit seeking to need satisfaction. 
Economics have to concern about care, social reproduction, and co-evolution of nature and human nature. There should be institutional change toward green society in which care, love, social reproduction, happiness, and co-evolution could be criteria of economic thinking. However, the institutional change might be impossible without political campaign requiring the elite of existing order to listen to desperate voices saying about crises of society, lives, and planet itself. In this sense, the change can only start by the resistance action. And then this action and institutional change can promote people's uh, capacity, historical capabilities. In particular, young generation must be enabled and educated to be capable actors for this kind of social change. Further, this change implies radicalizing democracy toward a deliberative one. The uh, transition to the just, democratic, and green society in which the youth would play a pivotal significant role will never require them to sacrifice their happy, happy life. In the society, the criteria of happiness should be different from the ones of the, uh, uh, the existing society. We must endeavor to find a new way of satisfaction. It could be called alternative hedonism. Actually, it, it, it is called by the uh, British uh, philosopher, feminist philosopher and ecolog ecologist, Katie Soper. For example, in the car dominating uh, urban life, hedonism is a fast mobility. But think about what we lose for it. Clean air, convivial life without noise, free and secure mobility, green space, and so on and so on. It is, it is another kind of hedonism, happy life, but we lost that, kind, that uh, dimension of happy life the, uh, 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 in, in seeking the profit and the uh, fast uh, car uh, culture. So we need to change the, our uh, criteria of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, evaluating the growth and uh, development and the happy life. It is my key point. Uh, it, it's a, a, a newly, uh, recently uh, published, published two books, Alternative Pros Prosperity, The Pleasure of post growth Living, is uh, written by Katie Soper. It's talk about uh, alternative hedonism and how to change the institutional and every life habit. And uh, uh, Professor Ian Goff, Hit, Greed, and Human Need, also talking about how to change in, in, in every life toward the green society. It's very good. Uh, uh, I, I have I inspired by, uh, by them. All of you now and young generation are eligible for the enjoying the quality of life in green society. But before uh, finishing my talk, I should underline that young people, anyway, must take responsibility to uh, build a green society. Of course, it is not merely theirs, ours too. I think let's do something together. Uh, thank you for my, uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Which I, I'm done. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sir Young Pyo, for your presentation. Let me uh, summarize uh, his argument in his presentation. Okay. The first uh, uh, thing uh, is his presentation defines the current society at the global level as an era of crisis in terms of political factor, economic, social, cultural factors. Okay. Uh, then he has tried to seek for the sectors of crisis and the background and the reality of crisis by sector and the major factors causing the crisis. Based on such a diagnosis, he has proposed some alternatives for overcoming the era of crisis. His proposals of alternatives include for example, from making uh, from uh, profit seeking to needs satisfaction, 
democratic participation and the planning and the alternative uh, hedonism uh, like that. In such a changing and the changed situation, uh, he, he proposed the, the younger generation to use role, what they should be ready uh, to such a changing and or change the society. So rather than uh, to, toward such uh, environmental sustainability, but toward uh, sustainable development in a broader sense. Thanks a lot once again, uh, Professor So. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> uh, now I think it's the time for catch on the answers. Uh, any catch on your comment on the two presentations? Yes, Dr. Jiang, we have a yes. set of questions from the participants. Like, you know, the first question is mm -hmm. what can each one like schools, students, or villagers to do for the sustainable development? You know, like Professor Young can answer or Professor Bayun Sewell can answer because they are, you know, they have got these presentations on schools and education systems. So they can answer this question. Okay, then uh, would you please say, your two questions go to which speakers? Hey, Professor Yang can answer. Mm. Professor who? Yeah, Professor Yang. Yang? Yang? Yang, yeah. No, I think uh, me. Oh, okay, that's a sir. Okay, Professor Sir. So oh. is uh, his surname, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Question is what? What is question? Is need about needs? Needs satisfaction, right? Would you please repeat your question again to what Professor Sir? What can young, school students? What can school students or villagers do for making environment sustainable? You you talk about religion? Yeah. Oh, I think actually I don't I don't never think about uh, uh, religion because I'm I'm socialist I'm scientist and I'm socialist so I I I don't I don't I never thought about uh, uh, about religion but anyway uh, I think is a uh, religion I accept religion as a kind of ethical mode of life so I think it is it, 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 nowadays uh, there is a lot of talk. Uh, about uh, affect emotion, so uh, uh, all over the world is uh, uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, new materialism or uh, and uh, uh, affect theory. So I think that we must change, uh, we must share, we must change the, the uh, institutional and material base, and uh, that base. <coughs> uh, uh, I think is uh, together uh, that change, uh, 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 the change of circumstances. Uh, it has impact on the way of uh, thinking, and and then it, there is a uh, many kind of complex uh, complex uh, si situation processes. There's the material life and the, uh, the, and the emotional life, and uh, and then there is a, some uh, I need some kind of a theoretical intervention that explain what is a uh, uh, cause of crisis and how to change and how to uh, discuss within some uh, uh, the theoretical uh, theoretical intervention is giving some boundary the uh, boundary for for the, some people uh, sharing the the, the, the idea about uh, uh, climate change or ecological crisis and the, it, in, in in that process is, is, is again the cultural changes so i think is a uh, religion is uh, ha, have uh, played a, 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 a role uh, partly but uh, i never thought about religion itself sorry about that okay thank you next question is like to professor Bayun, how can the role of youth in biodiversity conservation be included in national action plans for conservation in any country? This question is to the second professor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Pian. Yeah. Okay. I am. Uh, 
I'm sorry, what is your question? Please repeat your question. Okay. Yes, sir. How can the role of youth in biodiversity conservation be integrated in national action plans for conservation? Integration of youth voices and role of youth in national action plan. Uh, you mean the uh, national uh, election? Uh, so maybe uh, five days ago, so the Korea is the uh, uh, national election. So maybe uh, uh, Incheon Green Union and uh, uh, so many people and uh, use this uh, uh, propose the uh, uh, maybe green uh, policies uh, such as the uh, conservation, uh, the ecosystem of Geyang uh, Mountain and uh, uh, waste recycle uh, society uh, and uh, uh, the preservation of uh, wetlands of uh, Incheon. Uh, maybe uh, that kind of a policies are proposed to the uh, uh, candidate uh, of a mayor of Incheon. So maybe uh, a lot of uh, many uh, candidate uh, mayor uh, accepted the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, proposals. Uh, so they uh, uh, maybe they uh, accepted it as the uh, uh, official uh, agenda, official uh, issues there, uh, maybe policies. I think the, uh, that kind of uh, uh, political uh, activities uh, our citizen, uh, Incheon citizen, and uh, uh, young, generally young, uh, maybe teenagers, uh, very important uh, for uh, important in terms of uh, political, politically. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Two question uh, to me. I I, I checked that the one is uh, asking about my opinion about uh, degrowth, and uh, the other one is I guess uh, I I said I argued the transition from uh, uh, growth and uh, uh, profit seeking to need satisfaction. But some guys uh, the comment on my opinion uh, he uh, that guy argues. The uh, need, uh, uh, the reduction of need, is a uh, uh, green. Uh, uh, they are. Uh, they he, he uh, think is a uh, key uh, key moment and uh, the, the key idea uh, of toward the green society. Uh, I have some. Can I have a comment uh, reply that question? Yes, you can. You can. Okay. Precisely. Precisely. Keeping uh, in time. <laughs> Degrowth, I agree with that. But uh, I think Ian Goff, Professor Ian Goff's uh, book uh, talking about uh, relationship between uh, degrowth and the Green New Deal. Uh, Professor Goff's uh, main argument is uh, degrowth is sort of, is, is, with a uh, degrowth idea, it's difficult to motivate ordinary people to take part in green action. So we did some more concrete uh, idea about how to organize, how to, 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 to in, uh, motivate the ordinary people to take action, take, uh, take part in green action. So uh, golf, uh, uh, Professor Goff idea is uh, we needed some, uh, uh, how to say, the hegemonic idea to, to link ordinary people's idea to green uh, issue. So first stage, we, we can talk about Green New Deal or some, something like that, but uh, the long-term goal must be <clears throat> growth. Is, is, I think is a, the, the, uh, a cogent uh, argument. I think I agree with uh, the, uh, uh, Professor Ian's, uh, Ian Goff's idea. The second one is, uh, yes, we have uh, needs and the needs itself is uh, controversial. So I think the, uh, need, uh, we distinguish need from desire and want. And needs, we share the uh, non-human uh, species. So 
and uh, 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 different uh, uh, category people, the class, different classes and uh, gender and uh, the ethnic group have different kind of needs. So needs, uh, to, uh, with the uh, uh, needs, the, uh, the, we discuss how to satisfy the needs to, uh, in, 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 through the uh, deliberative democracy. And, and then we, we uh, I think is uh, some, some people, the confused with needs and the, uh, the consumerist desire, but uh, theoretically we we can distinguish be between two two con different concepts. So I argue needs these uh, concept of needs makes us uh, talking about uh, the uh, link between continuity between nature and and then non human uh, non human species and human human being. So it's a, it's kind of a, a resource and kind of information and kind of knowledge uh, 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 ba uh, based on that, uh, uh, based from that knowledge and information, we can discuss how to change our way of life, way of uh, meeting uh, needs. It's, it's, it's a, a very de a democratic uh, and green politics. I think is, it, 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 it is possible. I, I, my point is that I not just to, to <laughs> To uh, uh, accept uh, 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 existing level, present level of needs, I I never I never thought that. Okay. Any more questions? No, sir. Sir, can we conclude now? Because you know the third session is running late, so we can take you know something in chat, and then yeah. Okay, uh, then uh, based on uh, the two present, the contents of two presentation, question and the answers on the questions, I think uh, we can conclude uh, the, uh, this session, the role of youth in environmental sustainability, uh, in a narrow sense and uh, sustainable development uh, in a uh, broader sense. Then first one, uh, I could reach a conclusion based on the presentation is that the use is, uh, should, be uh, should be understood as an, uh, in, in, as an in, in terminate group between government, and citizens. Yeah. Then the youth should have a different role in environmental sustainability or sustainable development to government based on Professor Ben's presentation. Uh, the major role to government is a pledge group. And also partially, professors also mentioned uh, as a pledge group of use to government, uh, suggest uh, an alternative idea like that. And also uh, uh, another role is to citizens. Their role should be a teacher, particularly uh, they can be a leader teaching citizens for leading the citizens to uh, eco-friendly behavior in their every, everyday life. I think this is a very short conclusion uh, in this session uh, from the presentations. Yeah, thank you. Then I think now is the time for closing this session. Thank you, Dr. Jiang. Dr. Saram, okay, all right. Thank you very much for you know chairing this session and you know keeping in mind the time you know you know shortage you have you know tried to make in you know, very possible manner very beautifully you know cheered so i will move on to another session and uh, that is on role of media role of media in communicating climate change so our session chair will be dr rk sharma and he is the director of Regional Institute of Cooperative Management at Chandigarh, an institute under the Ministry of Cooperation Government of India, and works to strengthen the cooperative sector in the states of Punjab, Haryana, Himachal, Jammu, and Kashmir, and UP Chandigarh, to fulfill the demand of winning needs in the cooperative sector as well as the skill development. 
The institute also works for the resettlement of personnel from defense sector in association with the Ministry of Defense. And Dr. Sharma has done his BA and MA economics from Jiva Ji University Gwalior, MPhil in economics from Divi Ahilya University in Dor, and BA from Kochitra University. In the year 2020, he was awarded Doctor of Letters from the University of Central America, Bolivia. Dr. Sharma has more than 30 years of rich experience prior to his assignment. He was posted as director at the Institute of Corporate Management in Dehradun in Uttarakhand and was a faculty member at the Institute of Corporate Management in Bhopal and Dehradun. His areas of interest include administration with a vision to create development. So I will hand over this you know, session to Dr. R.K. Sharma and he will moderate as well as you know, chair this session. Over to Dr. R.K. Sharma. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Uh, the third and uh, also one of the important sessions in today's uh, this particular discussion is the role of media in an enhancement of environmental awareness and communicating climate change. We have the prominent speakers. One is Dr. Veer Singh. He is a professor, ICAR Emirates, G.B. Pant University, and uh, G.B. Pant University of Agriculture and Technology. Then we do have along with us. Mr. Rakesh Kamal, who has over 10 years of excellence in various organizations working in the climate change, mitigation and adoption in India and USA. He writes regularly on clean energy and climate change negotiations in leading mainstream media such as the Mint, Down to Earth, etc. He has co-founded co an online multilingual uh, podcast, Suno India. Dedicated to the issue that matters, he has developed education and advocacy programs for climate reality founded by Nobel Leonard Al Gore. Then we have another key speaker, Ms. Manpreet Khetarpal. He is the head of creative and campaign at Network 18. She is a content creator, brand strategist, proposed driven initiatives, expert with the demonstrating history of working in digital and broadcast media industry. Skilled in broadcasting campaign, content in innovations, storytelling, video, bizarre technology products, and documentaries. She has a knack for marketing and content. She has worked with MDTV to create campaign for environment and social issues, which are still top of the tongue. Then we have Mr. Ashish Wangai, who has 20, 24 years of experience in mainstream print media and online media. He has worked with Hindustan Times Delhi as a special correspondent, the citizen as a consulting editor in the past covering a variety of issues that reflect people and their lives. Presently, he is working with City Spidey, an online news portal as executive editor. So I'm not taking much time of you people. We are supposed to listen to all these key prominent speakers. So I first, uh, first of all, I hand over it to Dr. Veer Singh Ji, who is a professor at ICMR, Emirates GP Pant, University of Agriculture and Technology. Ah, thank you. Thank you. First of all, uh, Pranam Sabiko. Uh, I, I want to upload uh, PPT. PPT. Let me upload PPT. Uh, ये एक इसमें PPT upload करना है ये करना upload just uh, just just a minute yes it's not to worry please uh, uh, yes 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 done done Okay. Where is it? Presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell them, uh, let me say something about. Yes. Sir. Ah. Fine, fine. Sir. Okay. You can press F5. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Done. Uh, okay. Uh, let me begin with a uh, T.S. Eliot's short poem, or maybe a quote. 
where is the life we have lost in living where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge where is the knowledge we have lost in information and i add where is the information we have lost in meaningful uh, uh, meaninglessness okay so i shall i shall delve on uh, the, the topic uh, uh, eco philosophy for the environmental awareness and climate healing uh, uh, of course uh, a dismal scenario of uh, macro scenario of uh, the earth is in, is hanging in front of our eyes and uh, the environmental disruptions at present they are on their climax and uh, uh, one of the most critical uh, indicators has ap had appeared in the form of uh, atmospheric concentration level crossing 420 ppm mark at mona loa observatory in on april 3 2021 uh, uh, that was the highest ever in 3.6 million years and of course uh, global uh, warming and uh, consequent climate change they are setting new records so so actually what, what is the reason what is the main cause uh, actually the anthropogenic uh, causes they are uh, claimed by by uh, most of the scientists including the I, uh, ipcc reports but in my view it is not the uh, it is not the human person human species per se responsible for this scenario it is the bonsai mind bonsai mind of course a bonsai mind is the most serious pathogen uh, of all the ills the our planet uh, contemporary world is 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 facing of course uh, uh, and it is a persistent pandemic in itself bonsai mind of course it can be defined and i have tried a short poem on bonsai mind uh, of course uh, now there are there could be there are three types of minds in this world analytical and discursive mind which is a uh, which is very complacent with the status quo the status quo and this is limited this has limited capacity confined thinking and un, mm -hmm. it is unparticipatory the second form of mind is the mind with evolution sensitivities and the third type of the mind is the mind as co extensive co extensive oh. with reality so the first type of the mind that is analytical and discursive mind which is complacent with the status quo this is the bonsai mind uh, of course there are two things uh, uh, in front of us two two topics two wide uh, disciplines ecology and ecological philosophy or eco philosophy the term ecology was uh, as we know was coined by ernest haeckel in uh, in 1865 or 66 and the term eco philosophy was uh, was conceived by uh, professor henrik skolimovsky in uh, 1974 so of course eco philosophy is uh, uh, it integrates eco philosophy not uh, ecology and philosophy separately eco philosophy it integrates ecology and philosophy into a single functional entity in our contemporary world ecology cannot be meaningful without philosophy and philosophy will stay uh, cool inert incomplete and somewhat less meaningful without ecology because uh, the uh, uh, philosophy without uh, ecology without embracing ecology or uh, is is merely a an analytical kind of philosophy which is not much, uh, much meaningful in our contemporary times and and of course what um, when when they both unite into oneness a sort of synergy is created ecology infuses life more life and more life into living earth and philosophy affixes sanctity and new values to life and takes care of the whole ecosphere of which the ecology structures ecology deals with all the species philosophy deals with human persons to value all living forms of life ecology is for greening the earth philosophy is for greening human mind ecology writes the story of sustainable living planet and philosophy writes the glory of the mother earth ecology is the song of life philosophy is the human song in the praise and glory of life 
So this is uh, something about uh, eco philosophy, and there are certain elements uh, which the which eco philosophy embraces. These are living Earth combats cosmic entropy. So eco philosophy explains why is why this planet planet has evolved into a living planet, and the purpose is uh, the a cosmic. Uh, uh, the purpose is, is cosmic not the uh, this is not an attribute of the earth itself and a living uh, earth it it is capable to combat cosmic entropy so it is a cosmic design of uh, cos cosmic evolutionary design world as a sanctuary which is uh, which uh, eco philosophy treat, uh, treats eco philosophy treats the world as a sanctuary and the integrated oneness it calls for the integrated oneness life loves life life doesn't uh, love lifelessness every living individual of every species loves to be loved life tends to be in the mode of enhancement uh, veganism it calls for veganism and or vegetarianism and uh, um, uh, compassionalism roots of ecology canopies of cosmology of course it is rooted into soil it is rooted into earth and it come it its canopies they they are connected with the cosmos with the energy of the cosmos and of course uh, it uh, is capable to explain the terms like cosmo ecology and uh, and like uh, eco cosmology uh, of course and the one one of the one of the main reasons <clears throat> Okay, human food habits. Human food habit, habits, uh, they are costing the earth. They are costing the earth. Morphologically, anatomically, physiologically, we are not meat eaters. And meat industry is responsible for global warming to a significant level. I received a paper from USA which claims that uh, uh, meat, uh, meat eating habits of people, including meat industry, uh, including uh, rearing of uh, uh, animals uh, for meat purpose, uh, uh, it is responsible for green, uh, for the emissions of greenhouse gases to the extent of uh, uh, eighty-five percent. So, so, so this is uh, this is uh, of course uh, dangerous, and we and uh, we have uh, we have of course experienced even pandemics uh, because of this uh, uh, habit, because of the. And we, when we are following veganism or when we are following vegetarianism, we are closest to photosynthesis, of course. We are closest to nature. Uh, there are three phenomena that create, manage, enrich, and sustain life on Earth. And our communication, it seldom focuses on these phenomena. These phenomena, they are vital for the for the... So, uh, for the uh, sustenance of uh, uh, ecosphere, for the sustenance of biosphere. These are photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, and nitrogen fixation. We need these three phenomena of life, and it is all readily uh, possible for us to do because we ourselves are the supreme phenomenon on Earth. So, so we, can, uh, we can take care of uh, these three uh, phenomena. Uh, uh, and we can, of course, fortify these phenomena. What, what happens? Nitrogen fixation it imparts structure to all organisms, and therefore, uh, for the uh, structure to the entire ecosphere, to the entire biosphere. Photosynthesis it feeds most of the biosphere, and we are we also belong to the uh, community of the organisms on Earth dependent on photosynthesis. And the third one is chemo chemosynthesis, which nourishes the detritus, soil, and hydrothermal life. So, so these are the, uh, these are the phenomena uh, of uh, uh, ecosphere, and they they, they reflect uh, functional specificity. Of course, uh, we can we can assume a pyramid. We, uh, we can call it a pyramid of sustainability. Of course, and uh, its base is nitrogen fixation nit because nitrogen is a structural molecule, and the other two arms of the of the this uh, pyramid they represent photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. Of course, for the sake of of our de destiny, what must be our target? We need to transform 
we need transcendence from being homo sapiens to homo ecologicus a homo ecological uh, a homo ecologicus species i must say would be very much caring for nature and that would be a if a, 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 a species nurtured with eco philosophy ecological renaissance of the planet is an imperative not only necessary but an imperative for our own destiny ah thank you this is all what i had to uh, share thank you very much thank you professor sir ha ah, ji thank you very much professor sir oh, okay uh, this was a uh, really the think that uh, eco philosophy bonsai mind life yeah. love life and yeah. mind mind of econism coexisting reality ecology mm -hmm. ecological philosophy these are few terms which are really uh, plays the important role in our life yeah of, of course thank you very course. much yeah now thank you permission uh, now i request shri ramesh kumar ji rakesh kumar ji to please address us yes hi so um, i have, have no ppt i mean i i understand it's the role of media right that we are discussing today uh, in enhancement of uh, environment level awareness and communicating on climate change uh, so it's it's very important the role of media today uh, you know when everything that we know all the communication that happens is through media it's very important that media covers climate change in the way that it should be uh instead of creating the panic there is a need for creating uh, awareness about issues about how solutions can be uh, you know how we have existing solutions how uh, you know we have these 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 challenges and how do we communicate like for example we had one of the worst heat waves this year and um, what did we do i mean other than uh, you know there are guidelines that the government gives how will they be communicated to the people that is where it becomes very important on the role of media uh, you know communicating it to the most vulnerable people how would you communicate about uh, the heat wave that i'm talking about with someone who is old someone who uh, you know homeless people or you know how do you uh, question the government on you know uh, if they have not delivered so role of media becomes very important instead of so current i am uh, i'm uh, a co-founder of uh, an independent media platform called suno india and uh, that is what we try and do where we are trying to take one specific topic and do deep dive into it uh, the challenge right now that we have is news organizations have their own you know uh, way of doing things and uh, they are not able to give the enough time that ideally should be allocated and uh, hyper local issues where you know uh, things like uh, say for example uh, for for a uh, when there whenever there's a heat wave the government has to give guidelines on what has to be done say for example the temperature in this city is 42 degrees the government has to roll out uh, uh, water uh, there has to be a action plan for it right uh, there has to be water they have to provide shelters they have to do this 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 things but that is where the role of media comes in where the role of media is to generate awareness that this is happening the role of media is to question the government if that is not happening why it is not happening and to continue and help the government or help the people know more uh, about what exactly is happening so that is where i feel the role of media is right now and it's very important thing uh, i wish more mainstream media also takes up uh, issues related to climate change talks more about the science of it the science behind it in a convincing manner and talks about it in such a way that it is interesting for the listeners we are in a age where 15 second videos are being made right um, and that is where you know you need to look at being creative and innovative and uh, make sure that uh, the information reaches out to the people and uh, yeah so these i feel is the most important thing right now that needs to be done uh, where this communication that is happening has to reach to people uh, i can you know if you have any questions feel free to ask and i can probably explain what i feel more uh, yeah thank you to rakesh kumar ji really it's time to act as per you need for creating awareness in place of panics yes sir action plan should be there provided through media 
and creative and innovation should be there to provide through media for climate change as well as for the environmental environmental friendly. Thank Definitely. you very much. Thank you. Now the time for this Manpreet Khetarpalji to please come forward and give your comments on today's this gala gathering. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharma. And uh, uh, I mean, thank you so much to everyone uh, who was, uh, you know, presenting and kind of giving the insights. Thank you, Aditya and Bhavesh for, uh, you know, inviting me for this uh, interesting forum. And uh, I, I, all I want to say is that I have learned a lot. I have got a lot of insights uh, in actually understanding what is happening in the climate space and how so many change makers, which I'm meeting for the first time over here, are contributing. Uh, okay, let me start by, you know, uh, giving a little insight of what we are doing at uh, Net. And I'm very proud uh, to kind of share this, that uh, we are the only media, perhaps the only channel, which is doing the large scale initiatives on, uh, you know, issues which uh, uh, are very, very close to climate change or uh, perhaps talking about climate change. Uh, we are running called Mission, and I'm not how many of you are aware of it. We recently received uh, an award by the President of India for this thing. What I see over here is that that it is important for media to kind of highlight these issues and bring change make in front. And that's on a daily basis. And uh, we are not only kind of, uh, you know, we are going a step ahead. We are also, you know, kind of joining hands with those making our program. We are also influencers on board in making sure that whatever voice or whatever, uh, you know, cause being up, that is a lot ahead than what we are actually, you know, trying to do through our platforms. Uh, in that we have had, like we've joined hands with uh, Amitabh Bachchan, to Akuma, to Aya Rahman, and also with young influencers who are the change makers, which are children. And I went from the beginning of this entire session that how much we are emphasizing making that they are part of this, uh, you know, entire change, and how do we kind of, you know, um, engage with them in a more interesting. Uh, all of that is happening through our as well. And uh, while we are discussing the role of media, very proud to say that we are on the right, the right thing. A lot of noise around it. Uh, just. know what to do and mission pani was at all we didn't know whether about what's in their life of save themselves or to talk about her. so we quickly you know huddled together with our partners and we all came together and discussed how is it that we can create a one powerful you know messaging so we spoke to ar rahman and everyone prasoon joshi wrote such beautiful lyrics for our anthem and we engaged with children's Sitting from their homes, we created an anthem, which was the most powerful anthem. And we got so many children and their parents together to kind of give that message that why you want to save water? If you do not save water, perhaps you will not have good hygiene practices and you will not be able to save your life, right? So it is important for us to keep on kind of, um, you know, recreating or rewriting our scripts in such a way which is more engaging with our audiences. And that's what we are trying to our network uh, and uh, since uh, the media is now you know uh, into various forms whether it is print digital or tv we are also trying to create uh, you know content which is suited for all uh, whether it is uh, whether it's someone who's reading a forbes magazine or someone who's watching a news uh, uh, you know on our cnn news 18 uh, channel or somebody who's actually engaging with our CNBC platform. We are trying to give the message or perhaps trying to, uh, you know, create or bring stakeholders in such a way where everybody is able to kind of solution. So uh, that is what I, we are trying to do. And I think this particular session is all about role of media. And I'm very proud to share that we are doing our job and I'm more happy if anybody wants to contribute to our campaigns, guys, and let us know how to actually certain you know things forward uh, and we'll be more than happy to amplify i i uh, in the beginning of it i saw 
uh, Dr. Gitanjali, if I'm not wrong, sorry, if I'm just pardon me if I'm not the correct name. She talked about spirituality uh, and, uh, you know, the whole uh, climate and the nature connection. And I totally, truly believe in it because I saw it recently, uh, with Guru Raoul and there people from Japan, from Korea, people from where parts of the uh, you know world were coming to him and saying that you know what we need to save our culture but we need to you know add more of spiritualism only then people will kind of think of this one earth uh, so this is my uh, you know uh, simple submission to this particular session happy to hear uh, everybody's thought and take any questions if needed be thank you so much everyone thank you Manpreeti uh, you are doing a lot as a campaign on your uh, that network 18 and uh, we keep that you should uh, uh, do it in all manners in future also now i request mr ashish ji to please as time is short so i will take you very uh, hastily so mr ashish ji uh, thank you dr sharma for having me and uh, thanks to aditya and bhavesh uh, uh, this is a very important session, I must say, and uh, when we talk about the role of media in climate change, I think we should talk about uh, mainstream media first, because even today, most of us, we get our information from mass media, uh, mainstream media. So the role of mainstream media, uh, media you know, I am I'm a professional journalist and I consider myself a professional cynic. If you're being a journalist, one has to doubt everything. And um, the way I have seen things, uh, of course, the role of media is very important because the common people, they don't go to uh, um, specialized uh, climate sites, you know, they, they don't read IPCC reports and uh, they, uh, they, they don't have access to scientific papers. So it is the role of media, you know, to bring to, to simplify all these things and bring them to the common people so that they understand the issue, you know, and uh, how they are affecting. Because when we talk about climate change, we always talk about this is something which is, you know, this is the, the greatest challenge to humanity. You know, when we talk about that, we have to cover it in the same scale. You know, if it's something great, it is the greatest challenge to humanity, it has to be covered at the same level. So uh, we have to question, really question that how mainstream is, media is covering it. You know, when we talk about, about covering of uh, climate change, then we should talk about what is being reported and what is not being reported, how it is being reported and when it is being reported. If you talk about India specific, you know, I have seen climate change and uh, things related to environment become come into focus only during during a few months, you know, winter months when there is a lot of pollution, there's double burning. And uh, that is when most of the media is talking about pollution. So coverage of pollution has become a seasonal thing, you know. But but if it is a it, if, if it is a tragic if it is a challenge for the whole humanity and it is then it has to be covered throughout the year. Throughout the year, year we should be talking about it. Uh, uh, but but it has become a seasonal thing. Uh, people talk about pollution, and and we, whenever there is a, a, a free climate ep weather episode, you know, cyclone or something. So uh, the media talks about that incident. You know, they talk about the local problems and all. But the link between that incident and the climate change that is not being made. It is very important that that link is established. That is only people will talk about that, that this is something because of a larger thing. If we, if we restrict ourselves to one particular incident or a series of incidents one after another, I don't think we'll be able to address the big, see the bigger picture. So that scientific, that has to be made. And it is not easy because when you talk about climate change, it is a very scientific thing. It is not easy. So that link has to be established by reporters, by the people who are covering it, and then they have to bring it to the general public and explain it. That is the purpose of the, that is the role of the media, you know. And, and another very important aspect where the media should focus, and I think media is failing, is to bring in picture the marginalized community 
when we talk about social justice, when we talk about environmental justice. See, so if, if fishermen in Kerala are suffering because of some climate change, you know, rising, uh, rising temperatures, or if, if the pastoral community in Himachal is suffering because of changing weather patterns, changing rain patterns and all, who will bring their story? Who will bring their story? The, the, it is only the media which can bring their stories to focus because they are paying the price of climate change. So these marginal communities should, their stories should be told. And I don't know, I think the panelists, I don't know whether they will agree with me or not, but I don't think it is being covered in the same, in the same manner which it should be. You know, the scale of the coverage. I don't think uh, it is being done in that sense because we understand so media has to provide a platform to scientists, to activists. That is its job. Uh, that is essential, you know, when it comes to climate change. The media has to provide a platform. But again, the media also has to work towards policy changes. You know, if we just if report per one incident, one or two freak incidents, or we are reporting a series of freak incidents, but if you are not taking it to that level, where we are trying to bring a policy change at the governmental level, then we are failing in our responsibility as a, as a media, because this is a bigger fight. This is, a, this is this, the proportions of the proportion of this fight is much, much, much bigger. The scale is very, very big. The stakes are very high. And again, you know, I have seen uh, it. Another thing I, which is very important, I would like to point out here is the freedom of media, you know, it has been seen wherever the media is free, climate change is being reported better. Wherever the media is free from corporate or ownership, where, wherever the media organizations free from corporate ownership, political pressures or political leanings, there, there the climate change episodes are being reported much better in much more depth. And that link is be, being established. So I think that is also very important for media to be free, then only we will be able to have a, a, a better coverage, a more realistic coverage, more meaningful coverage. So we should not go from one episode. I've seen that whenever there is IPP, IPCC summit coming up or COP coming up, people talk about uh, climate change and all. And after that, people go back to Bollywood and stuff like that. So this is, this is very important. And um, I would like to take more questions on this. This is my initial statement and uh, thank you. Ji, for your commandable speech on the freedom of media, realistic coverage, then mainstream media, platform for scientists and uh, uh, activists and the policy change. These are the few issues which we should take as an initiative for this, uh, as an oath for the today's World Environment Day on 5th of the June, I really appreciate your sayings. And now, if, the, if any questions are there, please, you can drop in the drop box. And now I request uh, Dr. Vivek to please have their, his remarks and uh, conclude the session. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Dr. R.P. Sharma and the panel speakers, Ms. Manpreet. Sardana, Ashish, and Rakesh, and Dr. Veer Singh. You know, this, you know, media is definitely a tool, you know, which, you know, one shall not left behind because this is the power of the media to communicate at the grassroots level, which Ashish ji has, you know, rightly pointed out. You know, if things cannot be, you know, interpreted into simpler forms, the native language, in the, you know, layman language, you know, this terror will be, you know, greatly spread you know the kind of you know issues which are emerging up during you know like tsunami like forest fires like you know thoughts so simpler information has to be revealed to the wider people in outreaching the community for you know not creating panic situations so that has to be handled carefully and that cannot be possible without the role of media into it and you know good speakers are there definitely and you know to the end I just want to, you know, it will be injustice, like I should say, you know, if we cannot, you know, like, you know, many questions were not answered of, you know, session first. 
So I would like to name you like Ruyadi, Vikas Chopra Ji, Akshay Anand, you know, Mubarak, Dr. Vinesh Rup Marotra has, you know, shared their views in the question answers and chat room. We have tried to answer those, but, you know, I just want to, if Dr. Prafull Dhal and Bhavesh Ji is here, then we want, you know, two of the queries to be answered, if they allow, if they are given consent, then I can, you know, take another two, three minutes. Dr. Prafull or Bhavesh Ji. I just would like to, you know, do, you know, like sharings, you know, which, you know, participants have posted in question answers. Like, yeah, I think I, I'm there. I'm there. I can answer. No problem. But, you know, I want to come here. What should be done at the local level to bring about, you know, like, you know, creating impact on adverse effects on the use of plaster of Paris, like making idols during festivals and encourage people to use, you know, you know, material which is friendly with the nature during, you know, you know, Kali Puja, Durga Puja, Ganesh Chaturthi, because India is a, you know, like country where, you know, every religion has got rituals, deep-rooted rituals. So may I know your views to the audience, though? In case if you yeah, don't... Yeah, I, I think uh, very good questions. Uh, often I used to encounter this sort of questions, but I differentiate two points on this. One is awareness, the other one is sensitization, third one is action. So what happens uh, when you go with the awareness in a massive way with the social practices like the festivals or whatever you do, that is very good because, uh, you know, people get aware of the issues, but that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, impact desirably to the level of sensitization which can lead to the action. And where the leadership is the key, because I have uh, seen one thing in the tribal area and climate affected zones, what really lead to the action is basically some of the clarifications of the action points. Because, uh, you know, anybody you talk today, across the spectrum of the, you know, sectors and the people, they talk about climate change. But when the climate are two aspects, one is problem side, which many people keep on talking about. The other one is solution side. When the solution side comes, lot of sensitivity and lot of skills. And I mean, skill, I'm not saying in terms of the skill uh, frame, otherwise, you know, people do talk about. First thing, the attitude, behavior, and skill to develop the leadership. What has happened, I, say, I just share one example. While I interacted with the youths in tribal areas, uh, you know, they are the first generation of learners of their families. As you all know, tribal education has been hold off for long for various regions and for last two decades, because of massive illiterate literacy or school expansion, everything has happened. They're the first generation learners and the youths particularly are you know, oriented in a way that they want to have a different uh, kind of engagement in society. And the environment has never been in their uh, frame of mind. Though environmental resource is the key, whole world look for that, so for example, forest, for example, water, for example, agriculture, where the economy can grow, alternative can happen. And everybody looking at the startup, they look up to the urban area. They don't know that they can start the startups. So here lies the problem. So we have to have the meaningful engagement of youths with yes. a meaningful concept. So that's what is very important thing. Say, for example, bamboo jewelry. I started with 25 girls. And today it is 300 girls. And now it is going to be 1,000 girls. And I'm sure that it is gradually, incrementally, it is creating economy and job for them. And they are not aspiring to move away. And they're giving, started giving value to their own environment, which is forest, which is land, which is soil, which is agriculture, which is art and craft, as others talk about spiritualism. And so many things are there. We need to redefine our roles. And the leader's role is very, very important. I, I, I say same thing, you know, climate reality education in the schools, when we started doing a, you know, in, uh, green campus programs, the students came, but few people came forward and now they demanded the paper recycling, plastic, I mean, recycling, everything else. So these things, we can do the things. And I think youths being the 64% of the population of Indian to India uh, population today, if they can participate meaningfully, and link their life and living with the environment product. Because I think instead of transition focus, we should now focus with the new economy model that is circular economy. And that is the sustainable sector economy, which has huge employment opportunities. I can 
see this can work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Prafull. And may I want to, you know, like invite here Bhavesh ji in case if he give consent, because the question from Akshay Anand is, you know, like addressed to, you know, very, you know, complicated thing, which, you know, issue is there. Like he has addressed, now, the social experimentation has resulted in pocket of excellence, but why till now mass galvanization is not felt at this moment? I have answered him through a chat, but you know, in case like Bhavesh has also got a good experience working with, you know, government and ministries, you know, international organizations. So he must have felt in case Bhavesh consent, then he can answer. Thanks for this, Vivekji. In fact, I'll, I'll second what Mr. Prafulla said. Uh, POC, as, as uh, the question rightly points out, we have pockets of success. Now, how to integrate them and probably see the wider picture is the context which is missing. There have been policies, there have been implementations taking place throughout the length and breadth of country. But as a whole, we have not been able to success and fight, find widespread replications of them. For example, forest rights. So if you go to northern part of India, Himachal and other places, and if you go towards eastern or the southern part, the, the scenario is totally different. So obviously we need those localizations and globalization solutions at the same time as to how they can be dovetailed better. At the same time, when you speak of other industries, I come from energy efficiency background. So we have been implementing projects across India and I'm happy to share, share that sometimes it's demography also. So people coming from a particular region have better understanding with respect to prosperity, with respect to deep diving on the subject. And we were able to successfully implement the, the projects at one place, but at other demographies, things were difficult. So, so there is a bit of a dynamic interface that we needs to be enhanced more, I feel. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Bhavishi. And you know, in one line, I just want to have one you know, liner from Manpreet Sardana. Like one of the participants has asked from Manpreet that is, you know, News 18 is working on, you know, like drinking water, addressing the issue of drinking water because he has mentioned he is working with WASH in World Bank project. Just one line answer, Manpreet. Okay, great. Yes, we are, but uh, not uh, particularly in drinking water, but water at large, which is also linked to sanitation, but happy to, uh, you know, connect with the person. Yes, that's good. Thank you, Manpreet. And uh, I just want to go to now uh, straight away to Dr. Sunit Aroda to just propose a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek. I hope uh, you, I'm audible. Yes, yes, of course you can. All right, all right, thank you. So a very graceful good afternoon to all. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the word of thanks in this International Youth Sustainable Development Virtual Dialogue 2022. My foremost thanks shall start by giving glory to the almighty God for making this event a great success. At the onset, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the chief guest for the event, Senator Dr. P. K. C. Bose, Guest of Honor, Sir Professor Dai Yun Jong, Special Guest, Ms. Gitanjali M. Jayakumar, and our session chairs and moderators of panel, Mr. Aditya Pundir, Dr. R. K. Sharma, Mr. Bhavesh Swami for gracing this occasion and enlightening us with their knowledge and wisdom in today's virtual dialogue on International Youth Sustainable Development Virtual Dialogue 2022 while commemorating the World Environment Day 2022. My special thanks to our distinguished panel speakers from all the three panels who have sensitized us regarding three different domains, including role of cooperatives in sustainable development and community livelihoods among indigenous community, role of youth in environmental sustainability, and role of media in enhancement of environmental awareness and communicating climate change. Special thanks to panel one speakers, uh, Dr. Lokendra Thakkar, Dr. Praful Dhal, Dr. Salman Jacob, and Ms. Predna Shah for sharing their insights on various aspects associated with the environment 
and localizing environment friendly ideas for enhanced livelihood opportunities. Collective action for sustainable development through child focus initiatives and the role of decentralized government and economic development. My sincere thanks to panel two experts, Professor uh, Bain, Professor Young, for deliberating on the role of youth in environmental sustainability and various activities undertaken to protect the ecosystem in Incheon, Korea, and a new paradigm of politics and economic life in terms of understanding the ecological crisis and climate change. Also, I accord my appreciation to panel three experts, Dr. V. Singh, Mr. Rakesh Kamal, Ms. Manpreet Ketrapal, and Mr. Ashish for sensitizing us on the role of media in generating an environmental awareness by assessing the impacts of human interventions on the environment and suggestive mitigation measures, including grassroots initiatives. Friends, you all will agree with me that it was indeed a pleasure listening to all the eminent speakers and panelists. Dear friends and professionals, an event like this requires meticulous planning and eye for detail, and for which I accord my sincere thanks to our guide, Dr. Vivek Trivedi, founder of APSWDP, and Ms. Rekha Trivedi, Secretary General APSWDP, for their visionary leadership and empowering the team to accomplish this virtual dialogue. Special thanks to the organizing team members comprising Mr. Bhavesh Swami, Mr. Prasun Shukla, Dr. Vani Pervez, and Mr. Rajiv Chaudhary for their outstanding efforts and comprehensive planning in timely execution of the virtual dialogue on the World Environment Day 2022. Last but not the least, my deep sense of appreciation to the audience from India, as well as from different parts of the world for showing their keen interest in this event without which none of us would have come this far. All participants, please make sure to fill and submit your feedback form. The link is already shared in the chat box. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sumit. Now I will give the mic to Rajiv Chaudhary just to <coughs> share on e-feedback and how to fill it and instructions. Thank you. Over to Rajiv. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have already shared the uh, feedback link uh, in the chat. So we request those who are not uh, uh, fill the feedback, please uh, go to the link and give your feedback. It will take uh, only one within one minute. Uh, Dr. Aurora. Yes, sir. Dr. Yeah, how are you? Yes, sir. I'm doing good, sir. How are yeah, you doing, sir? Yeah, yeah. I'm very, uh, very fine. Thanks for inviting me. As Thank you so much for giving and, your precious and, time, sir. Yeah, it's always a okay, pleasure then. to have you with us, sir. Mm, okay, then the uh, next year uh, you are going to organize uh, this event again. Uh, hopefully, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, okay. Yes, then, uh, Dr. Vivek, if you would like to add. Okay, then uh, let me know when uh, you organize uh, this event uh, next year. Yes. Then uh, I would like uh, to join uh, this event. Right, yeah. Yes, sir, certainly. 
Yeah. Yeah. How, many, how many countries are involved in this event at, as audiences? There were 10 countries, participation from 10 countries. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia, okay. like your own country, South Korea, Japan. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll send you the list. I'll send you the oh, Okay, I'm waiting for the okay. list. We will, share right. you, we will share you the list of participants as well, along with their details as well, in case mm. you may invite them in future of your programs. Like mm. yeah. one thing okay. more, thank you. Yeah, one thing more, we have tried to you know develop this as a annual feature, sir. Mm. Uh, we would like to you know uh, like you know engage with you, and in case you know things are normal, then we have planned with you know our organizations and our fraternity. Mm. Come to your institute and host a you know a kind of conference or a kind of exchange mm -hmm. because Jeju is one of the you know highly preserved biodiversity, and I have been Jeju twice in the last you know nine years, and I am impressed and you know I learned a lot from your institution and unit R Cifal also. So you know, thank you. Huh. Civic okay, I, mm. yeah, that is okay. you know. Yeah. Or right, then please email me the uh, name of countries. Okay, I'm waiting for it. All right. We'll see. All right, sir. Goodbye, sir. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now we close this event. Okay, bye everyone.